A very warm welcome to everybody on this first virtual day of the NHSR Community and NHS PICOM Conference 2023. My name is Zoe Turner and I'm very honoured and very excited, hence I forgot to unmute myself, to be the host of the virtual conference days that we've got over the next three days with some great R and Python talks. I'm really looking forward to, as I said, to all the talks that we've got planned virtually, but we've also got next week as well in person, which will be recorded as well for um, virtual viewing on the 17th and 18th of October. Today's speakers will, will have plenary, which are 20 minutes, and some people who are doing lightning talks for 10 minutes. And we're going to ask that questions are posed in our dedicated NHSR community Slack channel. Details were through the scan that you saw when you first came in on the QR code, but we'll also post some of the links in the chat as we go along. We're not going to have Q&A or chat facility in Zoom because we want to bring everybody to the community space in our Slack. So if you could join using some of these um, links, that would be great. So just as a reminder, we have a very friendly and welcoming community and there's a high expectation of professionalism and conduct in all our interactions. And more details can be found in our NHSR way book in the chapter Code of Conduct and I'll share the link in the chat as well. Before I hand over to our very first speaker who is coming from the University of Ghana, which is very exciting. We're very international. Just to remind you that all our workshops are recorded and these along with our conference recordings all go onto our YouTube channel in due course for later catch up and viewing if you can't make it. Tickets are still available for the upcoming talks that we have today and the next few days and also next week. If you can find yourself in person with us, you're very welcome, no matter where you are in your learning for your journeys for R and Python. I'm getting very close to the time to pass over. Um, we're going to start a little bit early, I hope. And I'm going to pass over to our first plenary talk, which is on explainable AI in healthcare, interpreting and validating machine learning models in R. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and start your talk, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Zoe. I believe you can all hear me very well. Um, just a minute, let me share my screen so that we can start. Well, as we are waiting for the screen, um, I'd like to introduce myself a bit. So my name is Gabriel Agbobli, and I'm a, I work as a teaching and research assistant at the University of Ghana. I work with the Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science, where I assist in teaching courses related to statistics, statistical computing, data mining, and machine learning. And I also help students with their project work as well. So today, I'm not going to do more of a technical session it's just going to be a basic because I just want to whet your appetite. I just want to give you the info so that you can get more info when you send in your questions on the Slack platform. Explainable AI in healthcare, but validating and interpreting machine learning models now. So you don't agree with me that for the past a year or so, I mean, it, it was already there, but for the past year or so, the talk around AI has been everywhere. Everywhere you pass, you hear people talking about AI, AI, especially chat GPT, BARD, and all these AI chatbots. But that does not mean that they cannot be applied in healthcare. We all agree that the reason why we are all here today is because we are in good health. And because we are in good health, it means healthcare professionals had to do a certain job. So I want us to I want us to just talk about how we can all right, sure. Thank you very much. So yeah, I just talked about this and I also yeah, so so this is the agenda for today. I'll touch briefly on what is explainable AI and why it's important in healthcare and some of the ways that you can build explainable AI models now, some of the evaluation and interpretability measures. Please pardon me for speaking a bit fast. When you get a, um, the chance to ask your questions, you can ask as many questions as you want. And then we will compare explainable AI models with other black box models. 
And whenever we work around AI, there's the need for ethical and regulatory considerations. So we'll talk about that. Next slide, please. So the first thing we are going to talk about is why is explainable AI healthcare important? Why, why is explainable AI what it is, and then why is it important as applied in the healthcare industry? Next slide, please. So we all know AI as artificial intelligence, but then there's an aspect of artificial intelligence that's called explainable AI. And this part of artificial intelligence deals with the development of machine learning models that are transparent and comprehensive to humans. Because we all know that AI models sort of works like black box models. We don't really know the intuition behind it. But as healthcare professionals, you have to understand what you are using to, let's say, diagnose your patients, make recommendations to your patients. And that is why we have explainable AI. But that's why explainable AI is important. And it is very important, especially in sensitive domains like healthcare. For example, if you're a healthcare professional and you have a patient who does not have cancer, but you have an AI model that predicts that your patient has cancer, you go on with a cancer treatment, you may end up killing your patient. But if you understand the intuition behind these models that you use to make your predictions, you can know when the model may be making a mistake and the level of precision that you can talk with. For example, if you have a model that performs 50%, your precision your accuracy is somewhere around 50%, it means that you as the doctor, your guesses are way better than the model. But then if you have a model that's 90% in that range, together with your technical expertise, you can together make accurate or more reliable decisions. Next slide, please. So AI systems are increasingly being used in a variety of healthcare tasks, especially in the areas of disease diagnosis, treatment recommendation, and risk assessment. A while back, we heard that ChatGPT passed a medical test, right? And this is all as a result of medical professionals and the data available that was used to train these AI models. People think AI is coming to take the jobs that we have, but that's not the truth. AI is rather here to make our jobs easier and faster. Imagine that as a diagnostician, you, you are diagnosing, let's say, 50 patients a day. With AI models, you can predict, say, 100 or 70. It makes your job way easier and more faster. However, as these things are good and nice, it has to be transparent and accountable because we are talking about human life here. And that's basically the main reason why explainable AI is very important in the healthcare industry. XAI can help clinicians make better understand the recommendations made by AI systems. This can help them to make more informed clinical decisions and to identify potential biases in the systems. For example, again, if you are a clinician or a diagnostician and you are diagnosing a patient who belongs to a certain group, let's say in a minority, and maybe that AI model was trained with data from people who are not in the minority, if you have the understanding of this, you'll be able to know that this model may not actually predict the right information for people whose data points are outside the data that was used to train the model. That's why it's very important for AI practitioners and clinicians or people who use AI in general. Even if you are not a medical professional, once you interact with AI, use chat GPT and all of those. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I dropped off a bit. Sorry. Can we go to the next slide, please? So building explainable AI models in our next piece. So there are several ways that you can do this. 
But because of time, these are the ones that I will do. And I'll share the code with you in the community Slack platform. But I just want to talk about it for a bit. So for this, we will use decision trees, rule-based models, and interpretable deep learning. I'll talk about why we are using this in a bit. And then R. The reason why we are using R is, R is, R is I don't know, R is something that you can easily fall in love with. It's not really complicated. It's not really abstract. Once you understand what you're doing, you can actually follow your code along. And whether you're a statistician, you're a data scientist, you're a doctor, once you have the passion or the determination to learn, R makes everything possible. And there are several packages as well that you can use for any task. And then once we are done building these models, we have to interpret it. And the interpretable or interpretability techniques we will use are the feature importance analysis, the Shapley values, and line. Next slide, please. So decision tree models are, just as the name suggests, right? They are tree-like structure models in machine learning models that are used to make predictions. So it starts at the top, then it breaks until it gets to a point where you get the best decision possible. And as clinicians, an example of a task could be you want to predict whether a patient has cancer or not. So you can start with probably the age, so if the person is, let's say, 20 years and younger, the person falls within this range, 20 years and above this range, and then it comes down, comparing all the data points or the features that you have in your data sets, and then it splits it down until you get the best decision. And the reason why decision trees are often used is that it's easy to understand. Once I plot the decision tree plots, you can look at it and realize that Oh, this is actually how it's working. And it's easier. Next slide, please. And then we also have rule-based models. So these are models that follow just a set of rules to make prediction. So they are underlying rules. The model follows those rules and make the prediction. And the rules are generated by analyzing the training data. And it identifies the patterns that are associated with each class of data. And similar to decision trees, they are easily understandable and they can be used to make predictions. Next slide, please. And then interpretable deep learning. We have deep learning on its own, but deep learning kind of like somehow or some way somehow sounds more like a black, black box model because we really have to understand the statistics behind it before you can actually understand or appreciate what you're doing. But that's why we have the interpretable deep learning. So these are deep learning models that are more interpretable and understandable. So no matter who you are, you can really understand it. And it uses simple um, architectures, interpretable activation functions, and easy post hoc interpretation methods. Next slide, please. Okay, so we skip to the next slide. I'll share this. I'll share the code in the group. So for the model validation techniques, these are some of the ways that we evaluate our models. So when you are done building any machine learning model, these are the normal or the regular validation techniques. We have the precision, which shows the fraction of positive predictions that are actually positive. So when the patient is cancerous or the, the patient has cancer, how many, what's the fraction that the model actually predicts this person as having cancer? If the person does not have cancer, what's the fraction that the model actually predicts that the person does not have cancer? And then we have the recall. Recall is just a fraction of positive instances that are correctly identified by the model. And then we have the accuracy. So it's a fraction of all predictions that are correct. So the fact is in all the total correct predictions made by the model. And these are often presented as fractions or percentages. So the higher it is, the better. So we have, if we have um, a precision of 90, 99% is better than a precision of 70%. The higher right. And then we we have the F1 score, which is just a harmonic mean of precision and recall. So mathematically, it's just two times the precision times the 
two times the precision times the recall over the sum of the precision and the recall. Next slide, please. So, all the ones that I talked about are pretty understandable or easily can be done easily, right? Most of the packages in R, for example, the tidy models package, which can be used for machine learning models, comes with this stuff. But then that gives you a fair idea of the model. But our main task here is to really understand and interpret our models. So we have the model agnostic methods, right? And this can be applied to any machine learning model. It doesn't have a specific architecture or type of model that it has to follow. It can follow any machine learning model. And the two, there are several, but I'll basically talk about the three, three of them. We have the feature importance. So feature importance analysis is a simple but effective method for identifying the features that are most important to the model. So all the variables that you use to predict your model or to use to make the predictions, what are the most important ones? So if you want to, again, using the example of cancer detection or prediction, if you want to know whether a person has cancer, what are the features? What are the important features that constitute to make to a, a person being cancerous? It could be that maybe if the person has ever had cancer before, so the previous cancer status, it could be the age, it could be the race, it could be several other things. We can assume with our own eyes, right? But then when we use these things in the model modeling part, it really helps us to understand and we are able to talk with certainty. That's basically the main reason why statistics is important because we can all make assumptions but with statistics, we are able to add a certain level of confidence to whatever we say. Next slide, please. And then we have the Shapley values. So the Shapley values simply, the Sharp become of, often be called Sharp. It's just Shapley additive explanations. That's where we get the Sharp from. And it can be used to explain the prediction of an observation by computing the contribution of each feature to the prediction. So what it does is that it contributes, it, uh, it measures the contribution of each of the features. So each of the features that were used to build the model, it measures the importance of each of them. And then as usual, or obviously the features that are more important are the ones that we use to make our predictions and make recommendations. Because as healthcare professionals, we, um, there's a popular phrase that prevention is better than cure. And if you want to help people prevent something from happening, using these kind of um, model agnostic measures can help you in fair. So not, you are not only able to help those who currently have the disease, but you're also able, able to prevent other people from getting the disease. For example, if a person has ever had cancer before, and the person is following a certain lifestyle habit, you're able to tell the person that this lifestyle habit that you're following, followed with your previous medical record, can lead to you getting another cancer in the future. And this can help people make informed decisions as well. Next slide, please. Sure, thank you, Zoe. And we have the line, so the local interpretable model agnostic explanation. This is simple, this, this works just like the sharp values, but this is a bit slightly different. So instead of providing a global understanding of the model in the entire data set, it focuses on explaining the model's prediction for each individual instances. So for instance, one, what can happen? For instance, two, what can happen? And if you are someone who uses AI models as a healthcare professional, you are then able to know how to make predictions, make assumptions, or even go, go on with your diagnosis and probably treatments and other stuff. Next slide, please. So next slide. So we have black box models, just as the names are just, they are black box models. So we don't really see what's happening inside. And the advantage is that most of these black box models are more accurate as compared to explainable AI models. But the limitations is that they are less interpretable, they are not as flexible, and they are less robust. And as healthcare professionals, you need something that is more explainable. 
So that's when you go to the next slide. Next slide. So that's where XAI model comes in. They are interpretable, they are flexible, they are robust. But the limitation is that sometimes they may be less accurate. That's not always the case, but there are ways that you can handle the less accuracy measures. Can you please go on? Let's go, go on. So um, once I'm done with this, basically I'm done with the whole presentation. So the most important thing is that when you're using AI models, there's the need for ethical considerations. You have to be very careful about this. And the three main ethical considerations are transparency, fairness, and accountability. So transparency in the sense that you don't disclose the data that was used to train your model, because these can be sensitive information. And then fairness, you shouldn't discriminate against a particular group of people. So let's say people who are Latinos, your model does not work for them. That is not representative, but that's not fair. And then accountability. You should be able to identify who is responsible for developing the model, deploying the model, and overseeing how the model is performing. For example, ChatGPT, you should be able to mention, to say that it is managed by OpenAI. And so when you face any issue, you should be able to report it to someone. Can you please skip to the last slide? Since it's just left for one minute. So, yeah. So, basically, AI is opening several doors for everyone, no matter where you are. And in the future, you can ask, who knows, maybe someone is working on it right now, but you can develop new and more improved interpretability methods that can be applied to a variety of machine learning models. So, you are not restricted to a particular machine learning model. No matter what you're doing, you can apply it to that. And also we can come together as a community, right? As NHR, NHSR community, we can come together as a community to develop a policy document because we are the ones who are using the product. So we should be able to have a voice or a say, we can come about and then come up with guidelines and best practices that can be used anywhere in the world. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be in the Slack channel and I'll share the slides as well. So we can all get interactive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There are a couple of questions in the chat and they probably need a bit more time to answer, I think, but thank you so much for that. We're going to move straight on to Tillman now uh, with the Foundations of Programming Statistics and Machine Learning. I'll pass that over to you. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me and for the nice introduction. Um, yes, I'm going uh, to give a talk that is not maybe not as technical as the other ones that I've seen in the program uh, because it is based on a textbook that I have written with two colleagues. Um, so I'll just do a little shameless plug or you can probably not read it because it's blurring. Ah, I'm, thanks. That was, um, unfortunately, let me see. I'll switch this off right away. Okay. So this is what the book looks like. Um, and the reason why I think it's interesting <clears throat> to not have it blurred, or not have it blurred is that, uh, I'll, I'll go through the slides in a second, but I just wanted to give an insight what the book actually looks like. So we have um, the, in blue, the R, R code, in yellow, we have Python code, and we have lots of explanations and graphs in between. And as we progress through the book, we get longer bits of code um, as shown here. And now I'm going to switch to the slides. Um, okay. So um, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, this textbook, why a new textbook? Um, it's needed for analytics. Um, what are we going to talk about, or what's going, what's talked about in the book? And then I'll go through the concepts that um, what that we used in this book and why we decided that these would be useful, and why we think it's a new and necessary at all. And then in the final part, I'll walk through some practical examples, including use cases like how to uh, how um, 
COVID-19 infections affected nursing homes as examples of the things we introduce in the um, in the book. Briefly, the authors, so there's three of us. It's Professor Ram Gopal from Warwick Business School. He's a professor of migration systems. Um, Dr. Dan Phillips, who's a fund manager and also a research fellow at Warwick and happens to be a PhD student of mine. And me, I'm a reader in the Department of Computer Science at City University of London, and I've been working on machine learning for the last uh, 25 years or so. And um, I teach in data in our data science master's program, mostly uh, things like big data and digital signal processing. Um, and the three of us got together because Ram had already some material prepared and thought we should put this into a book. So why should we uh, start a new textbook? Because we felt that programming, statistics, and machine learning are needed by students of different subjects, like business studies, health, um, or for us in our introduction to data science, we need a book that gives a practical approach to these topics in a combined way. It's also needed by practitioners like many of yourselves who are working in the NHS and who apply these things day to day. And we felt that the textbooks that we have seen tend to be, well, not a perfect fit for a number of different reasons. So they can be too specialized so that they only cover statistics or only machine learning or only programming. And um, often, even if they cover multiple areas, they're often too mathematical and uh, technical so that they're not necessarily good for a practitioner to quickly bring things into action, or they may not have enough depth so that uh, they give you recipes, but you can't really understand how they work. There may be, oops, sorry, I, I got some, some widgets coming into my screen. I hope you can see them. Um, okay, sorry. So um, th there may also be a lack of, or there is often a lack of practical uh, concepts that you need to know in order to um, solve practical problems. And the lack of practical examples, something that also students often uh, complain about, they want more examples, and or they may not be using the current programming language. So we thought we should try and bring together all the skills that you need to get started in modern data analytics. Now, this is of course our take and you might have different ideas, different, um, oh, different um, approaches and I'm happy to answer questions on why we made our choices. So the concepts that we've been following throughout the book are to have a learning through coding approach. Um, first, we give a step-by-step -step introduction to programming, which is not a full course, but it's uh, good to get started and it may be useful as a refresher. And everything we do in the book, all the, co all the concepts, all the methods, all the algorithms are explained with code. And we feel that this is the most effective and appropriate way to learn the skills that you need when you do data analytics, because you will need to code the thing, the, the techniques that you're using. You will need to plot, to write the code, to do the analysis, to get the outputs that you need. We also follow a computational approach. That means we, um, we do not do the mathematical proofs with a few exceptions. Well, not really any. Uh, we do not do mathematical proofs that are often at the core of the more mathematically focused books. We leave out some of the details if they're not essential to know how to correctly and competently apply the techniques. And then we, of course, have plenty of examples with code in R and Python. And we uh, have worked use cases. So these are larger examples. So 
more complicated problem. Um, and all the code is available in the online materials with the book. So anyone who uses the book can download this and start immediately by running the code that we provide. These are the topics. Um, effectively, this is the table of contents of our book. Uh, the first uh, few chapters in blue are mainly about programming. And the following 11 chapters are about statistics, uh, some applied statistics, some general topics like time series and forecasting that use statistics and other models. And the last five more, um, chapters are about machine learning, um, building on the previously um, uh, introduced topics. So you can see we cover all the concepts that you will usually need. So we, in the beginning with the programming, how to read in data, how to visualize data, how to manage your data, and how to create a programming structure. Then in the uh, statistics part, we have the regular things you would expect, like random variables, probability distributions, and statistical testing. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that. And then uh, some slightly more advanced topics like estimation, linear models, generalized linear models, and diagnostics for regression. And in the machine learning part, we start with uh, standard models like um, uh, this, like decision trees, um, nearest neighbor classifiers, and then uh, go from linear regression to neural networks. And um, not really deep learning, but basically deep learning is neural networks at a larger scale. Obviously, there are many, plenty of new techniques that are being introduced all the time that we're not covering here, but this is an introductory textbook. Um, and final bit is automated machine learning, which is actually a more uh, recent topic, but it's applied a lot and it um, it uh, relates closely to the topics that we've seen before, that we've discussed before, how to evaluate your machine learning models and how to make sure they fit the uh, purpose that you want to use them for. So I'll speed up a tiny bit to make sure I get everything covered. Um, why R and Python? Well, I'm teaching to the convert, preaching to the converted here. Python is obviously the preferred language for machine learning. It's a vast ecosystem with all these great packages like NumPy, SciPy, and Scikit-Learn. And um, it's uh, the language you need to know for deep learning. Um, and uh, there, are, there are some limitations in statistics, but not very many. And uh, the managing all the packages can be confusing, difficult to organize, but it, it's just a, a language you probably need to know as a data scientist. And similarly, R is the preferred language for statistics. It has a great user interface with R Studio and excellent statistical packages, great plotting capabilities, but it's maybe uh, not the ideal choice for a general purpose. Programming language also has a in my experience, a slightly smaller user base. Um, but we don't want to force people to use one or the other, so we've included both. Everything is, except for the very last chapter with the automated machine learning, everything is in R and Python. Only last chapter is Python only. We're using notebooks. Uh, so notebooks uh, are instances of the literate programming paradigm where you have code execution combined with its output and text, which can include links and graphics. And for Python, we use Jupyter Notebooks, which uh, are extremely popular, probably the main tool for machine learning in Python and uh, available in ready to use systems like Google Prolabs or CloudBait system or AWS SageMaker Studio, or also in VS Code, which is very, uh, very popular um, environment for development. And with R, we have a similar uh, thing with Markdown notebooks, which are um, very popular with R Studio. And Markdown has the advantage that you can generate a lot of different outputs in a very nice and easy way to uh, produce a PDF or produce a Shiny app. Um, so also very um, interesting 
uh, technology platform. So we decided to uh, support both uh, to give breadth. Also, it can help people who know one language like R and would like to learn a bit of Python so they can see how to do things that they know in one language, how to do it in the other. We provide, as I mentioned, everything as online examples uh, with online material for students and instructors. And um, the, um, yeah, so I'm going now through some examples of what we do in the book. Um, so learning through coding is the, um, I would say the mantra that goes through this book. And I wanted to talk through one example that is simulation-based significance tests. Um, usually we um, learn about significance tests as saying, uh, how likely is, uh, is the observation given my null hypothesis? And then we use some abstract distribution, we do some calculations and we get a number out. But since we have computers, we can actually do a more uh, intuitive approach, which is that we um, take the actual data or we do bootstrapping and then we can calculate quantiles. And with um, uh, this approach, we get a more intuitive uh, access to significance tests because basically you can look at the quantiles in your uh, in the uh, distribution that you get from the data. So it's basically a, a form of counting and you can immediately read where am I in my distribution and is this an exceptional event? So a significant one, significantly different from the null hypothesis or not? And um, this makes it a whole um, more, a whole lot more well direct and easy and well, what's the word? Um, well, intuitive, I guess. Um, we of course also show t-tests and Wilcoxon tests for the regular um, approach, but um, even. Uh, there are even practical uses for this kind of um, approach because we don't always know what the correct distribution is and then we don't necessarily know what assumptions we can make and um, you can of course go for a non-parametric test but you could also go for this uh, simulation-based test. Um, so I wanted to talk to a few of the practical examples. We try to uh, choose different domains. The title has uh, includes business analytics because that's probably where most students are that need this combination of skills, but it's actually not just business. We also have health and uh, software development and things like that. Um, in order to leave a bit of time for questions, I'll try to be really quick. Uh, it's not very complicated. We have some examples, for instance, for how to use statistical testing to detect a cyber attack. Um, so you need to start by formulating your, or by deciding how to address the practical problem. What's the question we have to ask? Then we can apply descriptive and inferential statistics to um, develop our understanding, make sure we ask the right question, and then we can actually apply our simulation-based significance test to figure out whether a specific scenario and that we observe uh, is likely to be a cyber attack. Um, one of the, the biggest use case we have is COVID-19 in nursing homes. So this is about addressing a slightly larger practical problem. Uh, during COVID-19, during the pandemic, um, many infections and many deaths occurred in nursing homes. So there are data sets about this and we use one from California and we show how to do the data processing, the data pre-processing and um, we, how you can then answer questions. Uh, so we go for the question of are staff infections associated with staff deaths? Answer is yes. And are staff infection rates different from patient infections rates? Answer is no. And uh, again, we use our simulation-based significance test to keep everything as intuitive and close to the data as possible. Then as we move to estimation, we have here an example of startups uh, and how 
how much profit they're going to make in the future. If we uh, start with linear regression models later, there are also generalized linear regression models. We look at the coefficients, their size and significance. And we also uh, show how to treat categorical data with one hot encoding and cover feature selection. So all the things you're likely to need in practice. And finally, here is an example from machine learning where we uh, look at um, how people like apps that they download and we use decision trees. So it's actually coming back to the topic from the previous speaker where because with decision trees, you can also understand which elements uh, uh, of the data have an impact on the output. So uh, decision trees are inherently explainable and uh, we show how it can be done in practice. And we also show how to evaluate models, what are the different metrics. So uh, things like precision recall and F1 are explained and how you do performance comparison where you can then determine whether two models perform significantly different. And that's all really I wanted to say. So I believe we have a minute left. Uh, we could use that for a question or you can just move on. I'll leave it to Zoe to decide. Well just to say that there has been some discussion, I'd say, about where to get the book. <laughs> and ah, okay. I think the thing we have to bear in mind as well is because I found it in the UK, but is it internationally available? Because we do have some international NHSR um, and Python community people. I am, well, I have not checked. I'm pretty certain it's available in the US. It's published by Sage. You can order it from the Sage website. Yeah. Yeah. It's also available on Amazon UK and US, I'm pretty sure. I would assume it's available anywhere where you can order things from Sage or Amazon, but uh, I have not personally confirmed that. That's great. And um, just a really lovely comment that I think you should look at from one of your stu past students, I think, <laughs> just saying how helpful you've been and they helped oh. contribute a little. And so that's really nice. So that's that's the community spirit coming through. Thank you very much. Yes. I would right. like to thank our students for doing for helping with uh, preparing the material. And I hear I hear this book is already used in the uh, NHS data science group. So that is uh, fantastic. So that's okay. exactly that's wonderful. And we're at time, so that's a wonderful timing that we've got. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a good time. So our third plenary is from Tom, using machine learning models to uncover healthcare inequalities, a hot topic within a lot of our work. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? And Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tom Michaelis. And as I said, as uh, Zoe said, my talk is about using machine learning techniques to actually uncover healthcare inequalities. So... I'm following on from two great machine learning talks and hopefully I can keep the ball rolling on it. Um, my talk will likely be slightly more um, hands-on and actually discuss through a uh, problem. Um, so I'm not going to go through as much technique. I'm having a little trouble actually presenting. <laughs> um, give me two seconds. Slideshow. That's the one. Yeah. So uh, just to give an introduction on myself and the company I represent. So my name's Tom Michaelis. I'm a senior analyst at Edge Health. We're a specialist consulting firm uh, that work frequently with the NHS. And most of the work we do is with um, patient level data and specific projects, working with trusts, national programs, primary care. However, this piece of work is slightly different um, because this is all publicly available data. So this is a bit of um, work on the side that we've done just to expose some healthcare inequalities and hopefully drive uh, change outside of the normal work that we do. In terms of agenda for today, um, I'm just going to run you through the problem that we're deciding to focus on. Um, we're going to look at the data sets and how the, the kind of philosophy behind how we uncover these inequalities. There's a specific machine learning package that I want to focus on uh, called CARE, and hopefully this will add some uh, flavor to some of the, the previous talks and kind of get you starting in how you can actually use machine learning in practice. We're gonna look at how um, referral rate has a specific impact on diagnoses, 
And finally, we're going to look at how this impacts primary care work and the potential implications down the line. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to introduce the problem. So the actual disease we're focusing on in this work is lung cancer care. And this is because of its high impact. So we know that lung cancer is the most common form of cancer death in the UK, accounts for 21% of all cancer mortalities. And in fact, it's particularly poor in the, the UK because we're the second worst in Europe at cancer, lung cancer related deaths. So this means there's plenty of room for improvement um, and is the motivation why we, we chose this disease. One thing that's crucial with lung cancer, as with many other cancers, is that in order to improve survival rates, we need to diagnose lung cancer early. So you're actually three times more likely to survive uh, up to five years if you're diagnosed at stage one compared to stage three. And as I said, this is similar to other um, other cancers, but particularly pro prominent with um, lung cancer. And so how do we actually impact this uh, detection rate? Well, if we detect cancer at a primary care setting, there's a higher chance that we will detect at early stage. If a patient waits either by not presenting or not being detected um, at primary care and they wait until they've come an emergency um, care setting, then they have an 85% chance that they'll be diagnosed at late stage and suffer from the poor survival rates that are associated with it. So this is all well and good, and we can see the uh, associations of different stage and the diagnosis route on the right here, um, which backs up these points. But the, our first port of call is to see if we can uncover the same relationship using public health data, and specifically if uh, diagnosis route is a strong enough of a predictor of what stage your cancer will be if you're detected in them. So this is what I'm referring to by the, the setting severity relationship. And as you can see on the right, using Public Health England data um, at a CCG, clinical commissioning group level, shows that there is this positive relationship that we see between diagnosing cancer at a, via non-emergency route and the percentage of lung cancers that are diagnosed early. And this is when we are adjusting by age and deprivation. And we do see that there is still quite a lot of uh, noise with these predictions, but that's expected. Uh, we know that CCGs will have different practice, different patient case mix and so on. What's important is that even though there is this noise, we do, are picking up a statistically significant positive relationship between the two. And in fact, we saw that a 10% increase in GP diagnosis is, is associated with a 3% increase in early diagnosis for cancer. So that's stage one and two. So this is really important. If we can diagnose at a GP level, we can diagnose early and then save lives. And I know you can do this uh, analysis in BASAR fairly easily, but for reasons we're going to come on to, I've used the CARE package, which stands for classification and regression training. Um, in order to create a linear regression model between the input variables and the output, which is percentage of cancer that's diagnosed early. So just to touch on CARE a little bit more, essentially the, the reason that we're using CARE in this case is that it's, it's a package that allows classification regression solutions, um, but it goes beyond what is available in BASAR. And there are, there are two main ways that it provides distinct advantages. So the first one is that we can seamlessly integrate lots of different machine learning models beyond what is available on BASAR. So you can set up a workflow that has a simple linear regression model. And with just a few lines of code, this can be swaps into any sort of model that you can think of that provides the same regression or uh, classification solutions. And this allows us to easily compare the effectiveness of different models. Um, we can compare them to each other easily. We can also look at the outputs of different models in terms of accuracy. And um, so just to provide an example of where we might use this is that in our previous example, we saw there was largely a linear relationship between 
the variables and the outputs. And so we were comfortable using a linear regression model. However, in some cases, there might be a highly nonlinear relationship, in which case you could go about with a linear regression model, just picking up non um, first order inputs. But what's actually easier is you could use other sorts of models. In this case, we could use a generative additive model um, which works well on our nonlinear cases. And just to provide a little coding extract, um, there's other things that I haven't mentioned that, that Carry does, such as allowing you to easily specify your training regime. So in this case, what we're doing is um, providing cross-validation to our training and specifying our model. Um, so this line here, method equals LM is important as that's specifying which model we're using. And then also Carrie allows um, summary of models and shows how the model is working in practice. And all we have to do in this case to swap to a GAM model is just changing that method argument. So that's a really straightforward way um, of introducing a completely different model. And then we can go ahead comparing them to each other. So in order to see an example of where this can be used in practice, if we return to our, our earlier problem, um, and we've, we've established that there's a relationship between where you're referring patients from and their detection rate of early lung cancer. What we can start looking at is um, the nonlinear relationship between the number of referrals for lung cancer in primary setting and detection rate. So we're looking at CCG level once again. And importantly, we see this, this odd behavior um, where... The, we have on along the x-axis, we have two-week referrals for lung cancer. Y-axis, we have percentage of cancer detected from a primary care referral. And we see that when there are low volumes of referrals, we see there is a strong positive relationship between the two factors. While after we reach about 100 per 100,000, um, we see this relationship leveling off. And this makes intuitive sense. Um, we'd expect that someone who's doing very high refer referral rates are probably catching all of the patients that are presenting anyway. And so they wouldn't benefit from increasing their referral rates. But there are definitely some, G some CCGs where the referral rates are really low. And the benefit is, is obvious that they're just not referring enough. And then they're missing these patients who end up in emergency care. So as I said, this is the 100,000 100, uh, bottleneck. And CRAN using this nonlinear package, uh, this should say CARI, um, it showed that there is, there is a specific group of CCGs that we should be focusing on. And these are the, the low referring practices. You may notice that these, um, the CCGs at the top of, of this oval have also been highlighted. And while they are performing better on average, because they are referring low amounts of patients, uh, these should still be focused on as they can be areas of improvement beyond what they're doing at the moment. So in order to look at how we could start going about uh, improving these referral rates, we'd have to focus on the actual primary care practices where patients are being referred from. So once again, we've, we've looked at public health England data and ranked all GP practices by the, the number of referrals they're doing per 100,000. And we can see here that there is large amounts of variation between different practices. So not all GPs are reaching this 100 per 100,000 target. Uh, in fact, a lot of them are, and there are some that are referring very, very few. What the impact of um, referring more. So if we look at the those highlighted in the bottom left quadrant, um, if these all moved up just to the bottom quartile of all GP practices, we could um, see that there would be 700 extra early diagnoses per year, which would account for 100 lives saved across the country. This is a good starting point. Um, but there's definitely more work that needs to be done. So um, first of all, 
not all GPs are referring low volumes uh, for bad reasons. There could be GPs that specifically focus on things such as um, university students. And so they would never really be expecting to refer many for, for lung cancer as lung cancer is a disease that mainly affects the elderly. Um, another thing is that, is there actually secondary care capacity for these lung referrals? So are there GPs that want to refer more, but can't book people in, um, in time or adequately? And so referring doesn't really make sense to them. And then there needs to be a case by case basis for um, interventions. So understanding why current referrals are low is key. And this work doesn't doesn't reach that because we don't understand the idiosyncratic reasons why a certain trust or GP practice may be referring low volumes. So I think we have about five minutes um, left for any questions. That is everything um, I have prepared. Um, Zoe, I don't know if there are, if there are any questions in the chat. That yeah, there's one just came in. Um, what is the error term like in your GAM model? We're getting really technical here. Um, and yeah. it's percentages, so probably would be Poisson with an offset. Did you say you fitted linear model? Yeah, so um, linear model is just the, the X squared reduced, uh, the error squared term reduced. And um, I think the, if I remember correctly, we did have some Poisson um, variables that we're, we're looking at, but um, we checked that all the error terms were Gaussian distributed to ensure that we're having similar um, or we're including enough variables in our model, if that makes sense. I can see typing, so there might be some further questions to that. I'm going to ask that question that we ask at NHSR quite a lot. Is the code available? Yes, it is. Um, I can share that, share oh, that around. Brilliant. Yes. Um, I can see somebody's typing. So... I'm putting pressure upon them to type fast <laughs> to get the question out. Um, I can say it if you prefer, Zoe. Oh, Sorry, go it's ahead. Yeah. Hello. Go ahead. Because I asked our previous question. Thanks, Tom. That's really interesting. Um, sorry, I will confess that I'm um, a bit of a GAM model nerd and I am speaking on those other things. So apologies if I'm asking anything too specific. What I mean is that your Y variable, not your Xs, should be at least passed on distributed if it's a percentage because you're using a count variable right um rather than a continuous thing so uh, i guess what i'm suggesting is that because it's a count variable you're likely to have much more over dispersion at the bottom there where you've got that red term so yeah. uh, so if if you were able to put so like an error funnel on it it would really help understand that yeah yeah um in terms of a poisson link function between the two uh, between the uh, yeah so a poisson things. family and a link um the yeah, uh, it would be a log link function yeah yeah um, I don't think we did that for, for this one, but that's that's always useful to to pick up uh, errors of improvement. I think um, you should be giving the next talk on, on the GAM models because they're not, while we use them, they're not my, my specialty. Well, yeah, they're, I'll they're launch a, a peculiar in. thing. Thanks. Yeah. I yeah. will launch in now and say that Chris is doing us a workshop this Friday, which I've shared in the chat here and also in Slack on generalized additives models and I know I've shared the information that you're doing it with people who are not in healthcare because this is a very specialized statistical area but there's a lot of interest in it and it doesn't really matter that it's in a different field to healthcare I'm sure people will still find this incredibly interesting so thank you both for your contributions around this very specific statistical um, feature we're a little bit early though we don't have any other questions I don't think I'll just double check and just thank you again, Tom, and look forward to seeing the code for this and taking that a bit further because I'm sure it could be applied to other diagnoses and early diagnoses possibilities in public health. So that's really great to see. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. OK, if we are a bit early, five minutes, but I can see the next speaker is available. So Iona is going to, is that correctly said? Thank you, is going to introduce um, a talk on differential accuracy amongst demographic groups in prediction of emergency hospital admissions in Scotland. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear and see my slides? Yes, the slides are showing now. Thank you. All right. Yeah. 
So thanks for the opportunity to, to present this work uh, that I have been doing uh, for the past year at the University of Edinburgh. So this is about um, studying the differential accuracy amongst different de demographic groups in prediction of emergency hospital admissions in Scotland. And before I dive in, I would like to acknowledge everyone that has been working on this project. This is a very big collaboration between many partners and funding bodies. So especially I would like to thank James Lilly from uh, Durham University that has been uh, leading this work and Catalina Vallejos Menezes uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, so to give you some uh, rationale for the project and uh, the, motiva the motivation behind is that um, a lot of emergency patient admissions in Scotland can be prevented uh, through uh, proactive strategies. And we see that at least 54% uh, of the total uh, admissions were emergency admissions uh, in 2021. And uh, these emergency admissions lead to longer stays in the hospital. So we'd like to minimize this uh, and prevent some, uh, some of these admissions. So for that reason, Public Health Scotland has uh, developed a model, an algorithm that is called SPARA. SPARA stands for Scottish Patients at Risk of Readmission and Admission and gives a, an individual's risk of being admitted to the hospital as an emergency patient within the next 12 months. And this happens for almost uh, roughly 80% of the Scottish population. So for all those that have had an interaction with NHS and uh, we have data for them, either like uh, prescriptions data or demographic data and any other kind of interactions that had with their GPs. And uh, this can be used collectively to plan for future demand and uh, help use the limited resources more wisely and individually can be used to plan anticipatory and uh, proactive strategies uh, that can help avoid these uh, emergency admissions. So in the interest of time, I won't go through all of my slides. So the input data have been roughly for 4.8 million individuals and uh, the cohort is slightly older, has more females in childbearing ages and is moderately more deprived. So we have data, the Scottish index of multiple deprivation that maps roughly where its individual lives. And the outcomes were emergency admissions or deaths and we see that uh, we have more incidents uh, the older the individuals get. Um, and SPARA version 3 was deployed in around 2012 and uh, version 4 is under development uh, right now has been shown to has been found to to be good at um, discriminating uh, emergency admissions by type, the reason of admission and imminence. And there has been uh, a lot of work to, to show some light, to shed some light into the epidemiology of around emergency admissions. So um, the next uh, aim of this project uh, was motivated uh, from health inequalities. I would like to address some health inequalities and would like to to make sure to ensure that the algorithm uh, has the same behavior or predicts the same risk for um, all individuals, no matter in which demographic group they belong. And this is a rather sad uh, example, real data example that says that actually there are many health inequalities in Scotland and the gap, the, the expectancy in life years um, in Glasgow uh, goes uh, reduces severely when we go from the north uh, from the west side of Glasgow to the eastmost side. Uh, this is the train line and we see that we have more than 10 years of uh, life expectancy um, going down and this is quite alarming. So the basic concept here with SPARA is that we get a number from like a percent that's usually from 1 to 99. And this is um, 
considered as a continuous um, outcome. And uh, we have used metrics from the fairness machine learning literature for assessing the behavior of SPARA that usually work with a binary outcome. So we would like to map this percentage to a binary outcome uh, that says, uh, was the model correct to predict that the person was admitted to the hospital with this kind of confidence, with a threshold, using a threshold, uh, or the person was not admitted to the hospital with uh, this certainty. And uh, to do so, we have used uh, variables that have been included in model training such as age, sex, and uh, index of multiple deprivation. So these are all known to the model, but we have also used some more, some further information that wasn't available at the time of, um, of training, which includes ethnicity data and uh, location residency data, whether people are located in an urban environment or, or in a rural envi environment and whether they live in mainland Scotland or island or in an island uh, because this uh, dictates actually their risk of emergency admission and um, here I show you an example of uh, false discovery rates so we have been looking into uh, false negatives and true negatives true positives rates within different groupings so when we when we use AIDS we have two groups females and males when we uh, sorry when we use sex we have female and male groups when we use AIDS we have those over 25 uh, over 65 and those under 25 uh, and as I've told you, we have white and non-white ethnicity and uh, urban, rural and mainland island um, groups. So for false discovery rate, we, we interpret this as uh, the model predicts that someone will be admitted to the hospital within the next 12 months, but they weren't actually admitted. And this can be because a GP has um, intervened, so there there was a kind of interve intervention or treatment that um, prevented uh, th those pers those persons from being admitted. But uh, we cannot actually say because para um, um, GPs have access to this tool uh, since many years now, but uh, there is not um, its use. It's not recorded. It's not tracked down, so we cannot really say whether. Uh, some admissions have been avoided because of uh, SPARA being used and the nationwide uh, trial could say, could help with that. And this is one type of uh, uh, measurements that we have uh, calculated. And uh, the other is a uh, false omission rate. So this is the other way around, uh, whether the person was uh, falsely uh, predicted as non-admission, but actually this individual has had been admitted to the hospital um, after. So um, this uh, means that if the GP knew that uh, those people were in high risk or in medium risk, uh, would have intervened. Um, and we have done all this work uh, implementing some functions to calculate uh, these metrics to to see whether the, there is demographic parity between groups. Uh, this means uh, if the algorithm is independent, is the same. The algorithm output is the same, um, uh, no matter what kind of uh, group they belong uh, into, and using some counterfactual settings whether where we we check if the distribution of scores is the same um, if we say if we change an attribute and from white we go to non-white individuals for example and this is all available publicly available in an R package which is called uh, SPARA fairness uh, to do the same uh, analysis and we also provide some simulated data, some toy data sets that you can play with to, to compute these uh, measures so that uh, 
people understand a little bit better how exploring fairness can be mapped in real world data. And uh, another uh, thing we've looked uh, at was to decompose those false negatives. So from all those people that were expected uh, not to be admitted to the hospital, but they were actually admitted, we've uh, seen that there are some types of admissions that uh, are easily predicted, um, can be easily identified by the algorithm. Um, such as respiratory and circulatory disease. Um, there are some other diseases, some like eye, eye and ear infections that are not very well uh, predict predictable. And we have also provided a dashboard that uh, is uh, will be used in Public Health Scotland website for GPs and for patients uh, to access this kind of information and understand uh, what it means to be in a group, um, what's the distribution uh, of this group. So this is to nuance the probability we get from SPARA uh, with some more uh, information about the demographic uh, group people belong to. So we can use, uh, we can select the, um, the metric who want to compute the grouping and the version of SPARA uh, and we get some plots and some <clears throat> descriptions and some diagrams uh, to help uh, with the navigation of the findings. Um, so, uh, sorry, summary. Um, yeah, yeah, quick summary. Sorry, we're running over. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, most deprived. There are some effects that can. That there are some mediating effects of age and sex um, that are likely to. Uh, to di dictate these differences between groups. So people that are in rural areas tend to be older. So it's not that being in a rural area makes you more likely to be admitted to the hospital, but probably the age is the, is the main factor. So this is an exemplar of a population scale machine learning um, application that is actually deployed in a healthcare setting and has helped a lot with epidemiology around uh, emergency admissions. The index of deprivation also plays a significant role. Um, and yeah, this is all about the communication of risk. So even if a, an algorithm is well calibrated, there are more limitations that do not appear uh, as performance issues. So it's very important to do this, to scrutinize uh, in terms of uh, differential behavior. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Lydia, who will be talking about predicting patient pre-med requirements with R. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, great. So yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you NHSL for having me. I'm Lydia, I'm a data scientist in the digital research environment as part of Great Ormond Street Hospital. And yeah, I'll be talking about a short project that um, I did, looking to predict whether a patient is likely to require a pre-med or not. And I did this using R. So um, the whole point of this was um, kind of as part of the wider problem surrounding theater scheduling. So working through those theater backlogs for patients. And we wanted to deliver a model to predict the likelihood of a child, whether they need a pre-med, uh, yes versus no. And this is to offer timely and reliable insight to assist in the scheduling of um, patient procedures. So for those that may not know, pre-medication is given to reduce anxiety for patients for their procedure. And it's so this procedure can be carried out by the clinicians. So this is related to patient experience, but also it's an important problem because in terms of the like the backlog of um, theatres, uh, we want to reduce cancellations related to, for example, theatre lists overrunning or patients cancelling or, um, you know, various, various aspects related to cancellations as well. So in terms of patient flow, um, uh, this is a very simplified version. So if we've got any clinicians on the call, I, I have simplified this, but um, what will happen is that a patient will go to the hospital on the day of their scheduled procedure and they are assessed by clinicians immediately prior to that procedure. So in terms of this project, um, 
yeah, there's one of four things can happen. So a patient is not expected to have a pre-med and they're not given a pre-med. So that is as planned. A patient is expected to have a pre-med and they're given a pre-med. Again, that was planned. A patient was expected to have a pre-med but was not given a pre-med. So this can be um, perhaps the child um, wasn't experiencing as much anxiety that day. Perhaps they had play specialists or perhaps their, pa uh, their parents were allowed into the room with them. Um, so yeah, and then this project is related to the fourth um, one here, where it's the patient is not expected to have a pre-med, but then they are required to get given a pre-med. So this can cause um, delays in the scheduling, it can cause lists to overrun, and it can cause um, procedures to be cancelled, because pre-medication, it, it takes about an hour prior to that, uh, prior to the patient having their procedure. So you can see how this can like mitigate throughout the theatre list. So, um, I've got a problem here. I need to find the response variable to investigate this uh, in a data-driven approach. So um, there is, a, in the electronic patient record system that GOSH uses, there is an induction behavioral assessment form, and this is filled out retrospectively. So a patient will go through this process, and then at the end, there will be like some clinical documentation and the clinician will fill in information related to whether a pre-med was given or not. There is also um, prospective data um, where a um, called a anesthetic pre-op assessment form. So this is where, again, uh, a patient will meet with a clinician um, prior to their procedure by like a month or a few days before they come in for their procedure. And this is more of a recommendation. So it will be a tick box whether a pre-med is recommended for the patient, yes versus no. So I found uh, what I want to investigate. Now to kind of gather all of the variables that I think uh, might be interesting to explore. To define our uh, data cohort, the data extraction, we're looking at the SNAP specialty, which is the specialized neonatal and pediatric surgery specialty. And we've got a wealth of data going back uh, further than 2010, but I decided to cap it at 2010 up until the start of this year. So we're getting uh, a lot of, like as much data to really get the numbers from our response variable. So the response variable was a structured data. It's kind of like a pre-med given yes versus no type situation. And then I extracted out various different um, like uh, patient and hospital operational uh, relevant data to wrangle the uh, variables of interest. So once I've joined data together in various different ways and I've explored different variables, I've got um, around three and a half thousand theater procedures with pre-med information linked. And that um, was associated to just under 2000 patients. So we've got patients coming in repeatedly as well for multiple procedures. Some considerations and limitations of this, uh, this project. Um, for the response variable, um, uh, it, it's, it's like a it's a form and it is optional so it's not mandatory to fill out and you can skip it so clinicians can skip this so that highlights um missingness um in data which is obviously an issue um to kind of um mitigate against uh, uh yeah to do the project is as probably as possible um, I've um, omitted patients with a date of birth before the extraction day, and I did this so we are certain we have captured the entire GOSH history of the patient, so we're not just coming in partway through their patient journey with us. Um, like I said, missingness in this project I think was quite a big issue, associated to 34% from the initial data extraction cohorts, um, but I think we've still got like an uh, appropriate uh, like body of data to investigate. So some features that um, were led by the clinicians to explore. So this led by clinicians, but also what's prevalent in the literature of why a patient is more likely to receive a pre-med um, versus not. Um, we're looking at age, um, whether it's their first procedure. So that's why um, emitting patients with the date of birth prior to the extraction date is important. So we, we can uh, give that a value. Um, and then I, I was very um, aware to say to the clinicians, if you've got a like perhaps a subsection, a sub selection of patients in your head that you think, oh, I've had more patients that have like a, an epilepsy diagnosis, or um, I've noticed that perhaps more um, having an ENT procedure, like say it to me, I can explore it with data and perhaps I can lead you to some answers. So we've, I've incorporated those as well. So whether they had an epilepsy diagnosis um, or not, whether they had a behavioral diagnosis, um, so for example, autism and anxiety amongst others, and a, a feature which um, forms part of the base model, which I'll go through in a second, is whether they had a pre-med um, in their immediate um, 
surgery they had previously. So in the in the if they're having multiple procedures, if they had a pre med in the uh, previously, essentially. So just looking at up at the splits um, associated to the response variable, um, age and behavioral diagnosis were coming up that they they had different distributions, and I've just shown the age one here. Um, this is what was expected by the clinicians, and also it is what is in the literature as well. So it's it's our data is following that. So in terms of a base model, um, so uh, my my question is a is a binary classifier, right? Whether uh, they're likely to um, uh, require a pre-med yes versus a no, which leads us to logistic regression. So we're looking at um, whether they had a pre-med in their immediate previous surgery, because clinicians highlighted to me that um, the only way to know is if it's happened before. Um, if I was to do a model just on that, it'd be 100% accurate, but uh, that's methodology quite questionable. But uh, for a base model, um, this is what we found. So I'm going over this exceptionally quickly, but we're looking uh, as a base model, we're looking at our area under the curve. Um, to compare our, our like bigger models to, we want to increase that number and we want a reduction in the AIC. So I've just highlighted those here. To build up, um, looking at the variables that I, I previously mentioned, um, so we've incorporated age, um, you know, if they had a, a, if they do have a behavioral diagnosis, all of the various different metrics that I've previously um, gone through. Um, the model does improve. Um, but I wanted to explore also perhaps these methods were a little bit too like stringent. Perhaps we wanted to do something uh, or like maybe we wanted maybe a more flexible model and that led us to a random forest. So I know I'm very quickly skimming over all of these, but um, the random forest model um, performed, uh, which I did performed um, very similarly to logistic regression. And the feature importance, what I want to highlight is that I wasn't showing the clinicians anything they didn't know. So it's I've essentially just given them um, what was like, the data is showing what they have in their head. So whether they had a pre-med in their previous surgery came out as the most important feature, um, along with age and if they had a behavioral diagnosis, which is like essentially showing what the literature is saying. With a lot of my projects that I do, um, I think it's, um, I think uh, benefits can be made if you, um, have a conversation with the with the clinicians and the more like clinical side of things about like change management. So obviously I said that there's missing data. So is there something about these forms which are like like annoying? Well, not annoying, but like laborious to fill in. Could we like consolidate that so we do have more data? Um, so we can do projects like this. And so to try and to work with them to see if there's like an electronic patient record system kind of like solution to make their lives easier. Um, and the recommendations from this project were actually to review what information is present to the booking staff. So it's not clinicians that are booking for the theater scheduling, it's um, it's the booking team. So whether we could flag up something being like, this patient is 13 years old, so they're older, more likely to require a pre-med. They also have an anxiety disorder, more likely to require a pre-med. Um, and they've, they've been in before and they had a pre-med. So you should, uh, perhaps it is recommended that this patient um, has their surgery in the afternoon slot so you can get through those patients that don't require a pre-med or are less likely to require a pre-med so then you don't have the like the potential delays stacking up to avoid those cancellations. Um, yes, very quick run through of that. Um, any questions please let me know. Um, it was quite an interesting and short project that we did and it was quite nice that it kind of matched up what they were expecting um, with some recommendations I hope they make that life easier. Thank, Thank you so much. I think that's probably one of those talks that we could always expand further on for a webinar for the NHSR community. We do those every month and gives you an hour because I'm sure there's a lot of information in there that people would like to see further. But I'm going to move on now. Thank you so much to Anastasia, who's going to talk about linking NHS data sets in R. What's going on there? Thank you, Zoe. Um, hope you can everyone can see my screen. Um, as as I said, I will talk about uh, linking the sets in R. And I'm my name is Anastasia Skorinova, and I'm working currently in NHS England as senior economic manager. Um, so first and foremost, uh, just to manage expectations here, it will be very whistle stop door and very uh, novice level. 
um, what do we mean by this? Uh, by date linkage is uh, quite often when you do analysis in R, you will have multiple data sets and uh, you will want to look at different variables uh, for your statistical modeling, for example. So you will need to bring this data together, link it, uh, do data wrangling, which would take about 80% of time. And then um, if you're lucky, get to the uh, analysis side and uh, report your results and present them to stakeholders. Um, and the use case for uh, linking multiple data sets usually, as I said, statistical modeling. Uh, so um, there were some excellent examples of some very advanced regressions uh, earlier. Um, so if you want to look not, at not just patient data, but also provider and the uh, regional data, you might want to uh, link multiple data sets. Um, sometimes you might want to compare data. Um, at Hacker, there was excellent talk about how um, different data sources give you different estimates of GPI points. Uh, but also population health management, which is very, very hot topic now, um, would highly likely require you to look at the different uh, data set, uh, look at the patient level, look at their socioeconomic characteristics, and even things like housing. Um, in, as everything with NHS data, uh, there will be challenges. Um, and uh, in this, in this particular example, let's say we want to identify um, and uh, estimate what affects uh, length of stay. Um, so let's say we look at the activity data in hospital episode statistics or secondary use service data, and then we link it with the patient data uh, from segmentation data or uh, look at their socioeconomic characteristics based on where they live. And then uh, also look at the hospital data and see how things like uh, staff numbers or skill mix or staff sickness absence affect uh, uh, average length of stay in the hospital. Uh, you put it all in, in the final data set, and there will be uh, at least two big areas of where things can go wrong. Um, one is uh, you will have duplicates. You will likely have very different naming conventions uh, for all the different data sets. Um, your uh, financial year will be written in a different format in different data sets. Uh, you will have um, all sorts of uh, inconsistent data types as well as you go. And on the other hand, there are very practical and very uh, logistical challenges of high data storage. Um, especially if you look at patient level data and you look at uh, a few different years and you look at the whole England analysis, uh, but also computing power, uh, which is we are not spoiled by uh, usually in public sector um, on our servers and, our, and, our, and on our computers. Um, so if I go the talk about the shells with more details, I just want to share some more obvious, some less obvious tricks uh, that might help you to address those. Uh, so challenge number one is inconsistent data. Um, at first, uh, as I said earlier, uh, there are going to be some inconsistencies in the way uh, variables are named in data sets. Um, for example, um, um, you might you might have uh, your uh, deprivation indices being uh, named very differently, or you might want to have both your deprivation indices uh, for your um, ho hospital where patient stays, but also for the patient uh, themselves. Um, and here, I uh, would love to talk to Chris Maney uh, why IMD is not a good factor, but let's ignore this for now and just pretend it's just a, an example. Um, so, over very uh, obvious and very basic ways uh, to rename variables is either base R or tidyverse. And just the uh, usual very simple thing which makes analysis easier is to make sure the naming of variables is consistent um, and uh, make sure that it follows uh, good practice uh, and uh, doesn't have uh, any unusual characters uh, and is just generally um, uh, very similar to uh, what is usually uh, considered the best practice. Um, some other very common issues are uh, spaces and names. Uh, so this is something uh, we battle with a lot. Uh, sometimes, uh, well, I think most of the time, you actually are uh, replaces spaces with dots, which is also not great. Uh, this can be solved with one simple line, uh, string replace function, and your whole data set is going to be nice and tidy. Uh, also, upper and lower case, again, we all know R is very case sensitive. Um, so, uh, but uh, the NHS data is uh, is not. Sometimes they do like shout the column names at you, uh, ICD code, uh, OCD code, and things like this. Uh, also, 
a very nice uh, less than 15 characters code of uh, two lower function uh, will uh, solve this problem for you. Uh, and also, last but not least, uh, when you do link data together, you might have uh, column names multiple times. Let's say you might link SEDS data, emergency data set with your SAS, and uh, both will have um, data on um, uh, admission decision or admission date. Um, then uh, if you have, let's say, 50 different variables, it might be quite difficult to scroll through them all. Uh, so the simple thing could be to um, export the column names as a list, uh, do some sort of order uh, by um, alphabetical order, and just see if you have similar uh, column names or not. Um, and then uh, also, I recently found out that um, Styler and Linter packages, uh, which are quite commonly used for to style your code and to make your code more visually pleasing and easier to follow, um, can also, I believe, be used for uh, to make your uh, variable names uh, nice as well, uh, which I haven't tried just yet, but uh, very excited to look at further. Um, the other side of inconsistent data is obviously the data itself, the values you have in your data. Um, the simple, again, one is, as I said, you will definitely have to change data format. And uh, most of us, um, I believe, um, uh, had to do it in the past. And we can just use as characters, numeric as factor data. Uh, one thing's getting funnier is with date uh, dates. Um, Lubridate package is excellent. And there are many, uh, many different uh, uh, functions uh, that can help you make your uh, dates uh, comparable uh, or make your dates then um, uh, easier to read so that you can join by dates uh, if, let's say, you look at the monthly date at provider level. Uh, but also, again, the other thing uh, NHS data does, like using or any external source data, is to add things like FY for the financial year because obviously 2020, 2021 uh, is, would be way too easier for us analysts to then replace slash with the underscore or do something like this. Um, so if you do want to uh, manipulate characters, GSAP is one of the um, simplest and the easiest function to do so. Uh, so again, this example, you can just remove FY from your value, um, from your date, is, uh, from your financial year very, very quickly and easily. Um, and um, also, yeah, uh, there are gonna be some null and missing values. Um, some of them will be standard, so you will uh, you can easily check how many you have using as, as an A function, uh, but be aware that there are going to be some data where uh, someone just typed an A or typed null, um, and uh, you obviously R wouldn't identify it as an A by default, and you can just use replace function to deal with those um, examples. Um, I'm rapidly running out of time. Uh, the more interesting and more important challenge actually is uh, limited space and limited computing power we have. Um, I, when I just started doing SQL uh, via the uh, SQL into our uh, import, um, I was told just three data you need, which is easier said than done because sometimes you need to um, know what data is before you actually read it. Um, so please do try to save data as you go. And as good as CSVs are and as good as RDS are, um, Parquet is the very good format and very easy uh, format, and it doesn't take any time, um, any space, on almost any space on your laptop at all. Um, to Im import Parquet files back, you can use error package. And um, even though it doesn't solve the problem of manipulating big data sets, you can then use data tab table for data manipulation itself. Um, and last but not least, uh, the ActiB package uh, makes writing your SQL queries uh, very um, uh, much more efficient and make your SQL queries run very um, much quicker as well. Uh, I can see that um, Zoe is already unmuted. Uh, so um, actually, uh, there is uh, also Python, uh, there is PySpark, and there is also a um, mix of Spark and R, which is um, uh, deemed to be the very good data building data engineering uh, language. Uh, so probably, hopefully at next conference, uh, we will uh, hear about uh, Spark R or Sparkle uh, uh, in, in the talks. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I will uh, look forward to catch up with you all on Slack. Thank you. Uh, these talks are hard for me because I want people to keep going on <laughs> and we don't have much time, so sorry. So James, you're up next talking about creating Fecal immunochemical test fit for symptomatic colorectal cancer. This is a long title, Pathway Data Using Visualization Tools. Take it away. Thanks, Zoe. Sorry, it is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> I have a shorter date on the slides. Um, let's see. 
Can you see that okay? Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm James Jones. I'm from Nottingham University Hospitals. Just gone too far on the slide. Try again. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm here to, uh, today to talk about the uh, creating the ColoFit uh, data tool. Uh, basically, ColoFit is a pathway used here at uh, NUH to diagnose colorectal cancer. It basically uses something called a FIT test um, that is from uh, the GP. Uh, yeah, so a bit about my background. I'm a data analyst in NUH uh, within the colorectal surgery team. Uh, I've also just completed an NIR, NIHR pre-doctoral fellowship where I undertake uh, an MSc in data science. So basically this um, kit rate in the Colo Fit data tool uh, ties in with the MSc. Uh, so it helped me uh, create a, a thesis where I could combine uh, some of the coding skills where in R basically and some data science techniques, um, including statistics and machine learning. So that's all kind of created using this uh, data tool. Um, so a little bit about FIT. Yeah, so what is FIT? It's a, as I mentioned, it's a test that basically measures the amount of blood um, in your poo, basically. Uh, and it's used in the National Bowel Screening Program um, as their test now. Uh, and it, we started a new pathway, which is the Colo FIT pathway, where a GP can offer a patient a FIT test who is showing symptoms of colorectal cancer. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a pilot at NUH. Uh, the clinic, so previously, the clinical lead was manually going through a spreadsheet uh, of p patients that had a FIT test and going through things like PAS and InfoFlex cancer tracking system to see what their blood results were, what their FIT result was, and did they have uh, colorectal cancer, other cancers, did they have an endoscopy? So this was very sort of laborious for the, for the clinical lead. Um, we're at a point now where we've had over 60,000 fit tests, so you can't carry on to doing this. So it's uh, come to a point where we needed to automate this process. This is just a slight overview of all the data we had to curate in SQL in our trust enterprise database. Um, so basically, yeah, patient goes to the GP, GP refers them on and uh, here in the SQL, we've had to look in the pathology system to uh, define the cohort of patients that had a fit and extract their fit information. We needed their demographics. Um, we've had to link to InfoFlex to see if anyone had a colorectal cancer diagnosis following their fit test. And we're also looking at the blood test as well. Uh, and then we've took that SQL query and uh, connected it to R. Uh, so yeah, the aim is to free up the uh, clinical lead who's a colorectal surgeon, free up his time um, and create an automated process where we can create a data visualization tool that summarizes all the information about patients that had a fit and uh, follow up to see what happened to those patients afterwards. Uh, so why are this is a, an R conference? Um, at NUH, uh, the trust currently uses something called Click. Um, but for the tool that we wanted to design and create, uh, Click just didn't have enough sort of uh, functionality in terms of statistical analysis and sort of data visualization. Um, as I mentioned as well, it ties in with my MSc. So um, some of the work in sort of statistics and machine learning kind of tied in in creating this um, ColoFit data tool. And again, it's code first. So I could collaborate with my colleagues in the surgery team to um, sort of define and, and finalize the, the tool and some of the analysis in, inside it. Um, the approach. So ColorFit tool was created in our markdown uh, using Flex dashboard, which um, is just adding that little bit of line, if you can see in the bottom sort of left-hand corner, it's adding that line of code there that says Flex dashboard into your R markdown document. 
Um, at NUH, we don't currently have a shiny server, so it was easier to use this methodology in creating the our markdown uh, document, and then we could email the HTML output to our colleagues. That's currently how we do it. Um, and just as I kind of started this, uh, creating this document last year, uh, kind of all I could hear about was Quattro. Quattro is everywhere. So I felt like a Woody in this, that meme there. So I definitely need to sign up to the NHSR Quattro course uh, when I get a minute. So this is the, the output of the Colo Fit tool. Uh, and this is what it kind of gives you, shows, um, gives it sort of a dashboardy look with um, tabs. You can see um, each tab there has contains a different part of analysis. Uh, so I'll just give you a couple of examples of uh, some of the analysis within the tool. Uh, so this is the cancers found. This is the cancer follow-up rates. Um, and these, the, we have grouped the fit results into these four groups. And they have different meanings based on the referral. So those with a greater fit would go straight to an endoscopy, a diagnostic test. So we can see. That group has the, the biggest uh, rate of colorectal cancer on follow-up, at uh, 14%. And then, yeah, using R as well, we can do this sort of summary statistics on the, the fit value. And it's so, so much easier to do in R than some of the BI tools out there. Um, even though it's not a shiny document, um, it still has some level of uh, interactivity in it. Uh, so this is just a, a simple run chart showing number of fits by month, uh, but um, so using HTML widgets and a package called DUI graph, we have the functionality to hover over and see the values. And also this little slider here, we can change sort of the time frame of the, the chart that it's showing. Uh, just put it aside some of the some of the code how sort of straightforward it is. I'm going to that at this point. Uh, some other from uh, interactivity um, on the sort of a geographical view. So this is sort of a map of Nottingham. Um, this is split by parliamentary ward showing numbers of fit tests per 100,000 population. Uh, so this is just an example. You can see I've hovered over one of the parliamentary wards and we get that rate per 100,000 as well showing. It just shows that we can, even though it's not a shiny document, there still is some level of interactivity. Something else that's within the tool that we wouldn't be able to do without R in a, in a BI tool is um, survival analysis. And this is something that's very, uh, the, the surgery team are very keen on. So this is basically looking at patients. Here is a, uh, a Kaplan-Myers plot showing survival probabilities following colorectal cancer diagnosis. And it's split by early and late cancer uh, staging. So one and two early, three and four uh, late. And, as we did expect, but it's just um, another level of what this tool is offering that we couldn't get anywhere else. Um, and this is NUH's own data and it's it's uh, live, sort of. <laughs> and again, there's some code there. I'm just gonna check how I'm doing for time. Am I going over slightly? <laughs> Got one minute. One minute, okay. Um, always past a couple. So yeah, this uh, it has some statistical analysis in that we don't traditionally have in some of our BI tools and, and something we're working on as well is even adding in some of the outputs some from some uh, machine learning algorithms um, so this is classification model uh, using patients numeric fit results and their age at diagnosis to classify patients that had a correct cancer or didn't um, and the little table at the bottom is a probability table uh, this is some of the outputs that we're tend to add into the tool uh, so just for example the top line showing patients that had a, a fit of over 100 hemoglobin and are 65 years of over have the, the greatest um, chances of colorectal cancer which fits in with our referral guidelines uh, so yeah just the last slide now is uh, on sharing the tool so this is the the kind of only negative really is that at this point we have to 
email out the HTML file to our colleagues and uh, users of the tool. Um, but just kind of exploring other avenues of how we could do this. So looking at posting somewhere where we can do access control, whether that's the intranet or Git labs. Um, but I think the biggest thing is trying to convince the trust uh, to invest in Posit Connect, which we're, we're working on, and that would be the dream. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Passing now on to Sally, who's going to talk about system dynamics in health and social care, trying to fit a square data, trying to fit square data into round models. And I'll also share the slides as well in the chat. Thank you. Um, right, are we sharing? Oh no, I need to hit the share button. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So um, my name's Sally Thompson. I'm an analyst in the strategy unit. Um, and then my main focus is in simulation modeling. And I'm just gonna do a quick talk about how we try to um, wrangle health and care data to fit into my system dynamics model. So we are, we're used to seeing um, headlines like this, quite good at giving a snapshot figure, but it doesn't really say much about the, the system as a whole. Here I've started seeing a bit of a change. Um, so headlines that now recognize and rather than just snapshots at one at, of one part of the system. And if we're able to um, map the system, um, we can get a better understanding of it. Um, so mapping it as uh, stocks and flows, um, we can, can get a better understanding of that. But our data sets aren't designed to give up this information very easily. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick talk about how we try to meet that challenge. So first of all, uh, quick very quick intro to what is system dynamics. Um, so it's an approach to understanding the behavior of complex systems over time. And uh, we can map the system as a series of stocks and the level of a stock can only change due to flows in and flows out. And that stock could be people on a waiting list, people on a ward, money, your bank balance, um, or the money in your bank account would be a stock. The flows are the rate at which things change in a given time period. So admissions per day, referrals per month, that kind of thing. Behaviour of the system is determined by how each of the components interact with each other um, and not by what each of the component actually does. If we can map the structure of the system like this, it can help us identify feedback loops and the consequences of actions. Um, so both intended consequences and more often the unintended. I identify them earlier on. So in this um, diagram, we're looking at a capacity constraint model. We only need three parameters to run that model, and that's the um, things in the red circles. Everything within the gray rectangular box is determined by, within that, within this, the structure there, um, by the interactions of the components within that. But how do we get, say, the value for the referrals per, per day? And how can we verify that the model we've built is actually a reasonable representation of reality? And that's where we start needing to get into um, our health data. So I'm just going to do a bit quick visual um, talk through what we do before we get into the code. So in this even simpler model, um, we've got a flow into a stock of people on the ward and then, um, then get pulled out by their length of stay. Um, so to get flows, that's quite straightforward. Um, we've got a key list of key dates that we would be looking to um, get historical data for. So in here, could have a list of um, every day in 2022. We've then got our patient level data. We need an admission date and discharge date. And we can just do a count. If, we, if our models are running in days, we could just do a count. How many admissions were there on each day? And then group that up. So that's quite straightforward. Or we could do it by week, we could do it month by month. Um, occupancy is a bit bit more work required for this. Um, so we may want to um, see what our war data is and say to verify it against what the model um, model's generating. So again, we've got a list of key dates and our patient level data. And what we do is we build up a, a wide data set. So we take each date in my key date and we look to see was each patient were they admitted before that key date and discharged after. So on the 1st of January, we had two patients that were in on that ward. And patient E was admitted, um, was the day, so they were resident um, 
or they had been admitted be before. So they were resident on the 2nd of January. Patient A was admitted on the 2nd, so they don't become resident until the 3rd. So we build up a very wide data set and then just summarize that um, for a count for each day and then get a total for how many were resident on each day. So that's kind of what we're trying to achieve. How do we do that in R? So the flow rate, <laughs> excuse me, flow rate's quite straightforward. Uh, we could just do a use counts or group by and summarize. Um, the occupancy, as I said, it's a, it's a bit more detail to that. So we start by generating my list of key dates and then determine what the run length is. So if we're looking at every day in a year, then it's 365, in this case for 2022. If we were doing weekly data, if it was a year's worth, it'll be 52. And we need that run length to know how many times we need to iterate over. Then the, the code here. So we um, written this into a function. So we start with um, pre-allocating a tibble, which is the same number of rows as a patient data. And that just speeds up setting it all off. Then for each um, key date that we've got, we're creating a column, um, which is again, the length of the number of patients in the patient data. And we're just comparing, was the admission date for that patient before my key date and was a discharge date after? And if both of those are true, then they get a one for their flag, otherwise they get a zero. Then we take that column of activity period and I bind it to activity all. So as this iterates through, it gets wider and wider and wider. Once we've done it for, in this case, the 365 days, just do a bit of admin that, so rename the column name, so it's got the date included in it, so we know what date we're referring to. Make it a very long <coughs> um, data frame, so then we can group by and summarize. And in the grouping part, we might add in extra um, variables there. We might group by treatment function code or provider codes or whatever combination you want with that. So my question to you, I, I know the answer to this. I'm sure there is a better way of doing this in a for loop. Um, I just don't know how. I'm guessing it's per maps and things, but that's on the edge of my comfort zone there with that one. We might not want to run our models in days. Um, care home might be more reasonable to be running it in months, um, could be doing it in weeks. So the, you need to have a think about that because you can't just do all that work in days and then group up. My flow rate, I created an extra variable here that's just the date that each week starts and then I'm grouping by that variable. With the occupancy, um, as well as having the, the start date of that, I've got, so here we've got the date that the week starts and the date at the end of that week. And my logic to create the flag is just checking, was that patient admitted before the week started and discharged after the end of the week to get that one for their occupancy flag. So that's great. We've got our system dynamic model. We know what data we need from our health data sets. We've done that wrangling of it. How do we put it back into our model? So we've got the admissions data. We could reduce it to a single value. We could just take an average. You could start looking at other patterns. Is it seasonal? Other patterns like week to week or day of the week? Um, but that would be an input to my model. The occupancy, and you might look at discharges as well, can be used to verify your model. So in this image here, my model data, it's a very simple model, and they're all single values for admissions and length of stay. So my ward is just that red value, so it doesn't change. And behind it is my actual data, and you can see that the variation in that. So we can test, <laughs> excuse me, we can test to see, is my model replicating reality reasonably well? Do we need to adjust the parameters or calibrate it? So the next steps for me are to generalize that function to a state where I can give it to other people and they can use it themselves without me having to support them. And um, so far we haven't got there yet. Um, after that, really getting outside my comfort zone and turning it into a package. Um, and then generally is going open source with the sharing of our models. So we use specialist software to build the model and then share it. Um, but we would like to be able to do the sharing of it where our users can interact with it in something like um, an RSHIME interface or 
Python if we need to, to for that. Um, so that's all for me. I, I'm very open to ideas and suggestions um, and also questions about if you want to find out more about um, system dynamics. Good. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. And that's a wonderful uh, opening up of questions to end on. We're just going to have a short break. We're going to come back at five past three so you can get up, move away from your computer. Things are coming through for questions for people and there are conversations. And um, just see you in a few minutes time. Thank you very much for that last talk before the break, Sally, and that opening up for more input. That's really Thank great. You.
Hello. 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 Hello and welcome back. I'm just about to introduce Jake um, to come and talk about the primary care costs of long COVID. Over to you. Thanks, Louis. Uh, can everyone see that? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Hi, uh, I'm Jake from Data Scientist. Um, I'm talking to you about a study I did looking at the primary care costs of long COVID in England. Um, just a word of warning, it's there's no it's not too cody, um, which is a shame, but it's I think it's interesting. Uh, oh yeah. uh, so firstly, what is long COVID? It's the ongoing symptoms of COVID-19 12 weeks post acute infection. Uh, and there's a whole range of common symptoms. Um, so the classics are sort of brain fog and chest pains. Uh, why, why do you want to cost it? Uh, at the time I did the study, probably about a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, there was no, um, no studies looking into the costs of, of COVID or, 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 or long COVID. Uh, and obviously it was, it was a huge impact on the NHS and the, and the healthcare system. Um, so really just to find out a bit more about the kind of quantity of costs it could be in. So the hypothesis was that patients with long COVID would incur higher healthcare costs than their non-diagnosed healthy counterparts. The aim was to quantify the incremental, co incremental costs associated with long COVID and to assess how these costs uh, differed across um, subgroups of risk factors. So the data set I used uh, is called CPID Aurum. It's a primary care data set collected from um, EMIS. There are, I think, 100 GP GPs um, sort of uh, set up with it and about 10, 10 million patients. Uh, and it's been shown to be rep nationally representative of the population and includes data on the consultation type, the healthcare professional, uh, and patient characteristics like their smoking status, comorbidities, and of course, um, whether or not they had COVID or long COVID. So the incremental cost approach, this is a, a gold standard uh, costing approach in, 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 in healthcare. Um, there's a number of ways you can do it, but I use the match control method. And the whole idea of this is that you match a, uh, a healthy cohort to uh, an infected cohort, i.e. The, the long COVID cohort on a number of um, uh, baseline characteristics. So like their comorbidities, uh, and then, so the only difference between the two groups is that their one patient has long COVID and the other does not. Uh, and then you sum up the, their, their healthcare costs um, and the difference between the, between the two groups is the incremental, incremental cost. Uh, and the nice thing with this is it really isolates the cost um, attributable to the illness. So you can really find uh, exactly how much of the cost is associated to, to long COVID. So the patient groups, uh, there's the healthy non-diagnosed patients, uh, and then the diagnosed COVID-19 patients, long di diagnosed long COVID patients, uh, and then patients who had COVID-19 and also showed symptoms of long COVID who weren't diagnosed with it. Uh, and we look at these because um, the data, the data that I was looking at was from the start of the pandemic. So there were issues around uh, diagnoses at that point, especially during the sort of first year when it wasn't, wasn't that known about. So it's kind of a sensitivity analysis. Um, so this is the data handling process. I used a whole range of softwares, Python, data and R, which is um, slightly strange. <laughs> I, can, I can understand, uh, but the, the sort of key reasons were I harnessed some, some of the powers of, of each. Um, so Python mainly, mainly for, for the data cleaning, uh, Stata for the uh, matching and some, some statistical analysis, and then R for producing the plots. Um, so in the data cleaning, this was kind of just classic things such as um, checking for missing values, when he's missing at random, um, other things such as merging together data sets and checking that these will merge properly, creating dummy variables, um, and looking at eligibility checks as well, such as um, there are patients in there who, who died before being, being infected, um, so re removing patients like that. Um, post for data cleaning uh, and onto the, the matching. Um, so this is a propensity score matching within Stata. Um, the reason for that was mainly because I've done it before in Stata. I tried doing it in Python, but it didn't work, so I kind of just went back to what I knew. Um, but uh, use, it uses a logistic regression where the um, dependent variable is the propensity to 
uh, to consume healthcare. And then the independent variables are the characteristics that we're trying to match on. So all the things on the left there, um, such as smoking status, um, their, the location of their practice, uh, comorbidities, things like that. Um, and then the way it works is you run the regression, you get a, a P-score um, and you filter on this P-score iteratively until you find the um, patients that are closest matching to the infected patients. Uh, and then finally, um, the actual costing. So use a bottom-up costing method, which is where you um, cost every individual. And this is their healthcare consumption times the healthcare uh, unit cost. Uh, and then to find the incremental costs, it's the sum of the total costs in each uh, cohort. Um, but, and then the difference between the two cohorts. So the matching was really successful. Uh, this is mainly due to the large um, uh, data set sample size. Um, but we can see here on the left, um, there's two plots. One is a kind of density plot uh, showing the before and after matching and um, the, the groups are very similar after matching. Uh, and again, in the bottom is the standardized differences across the different um, characteristics. Uh, and as, as you can see, there's only one greater than 0.05%. So this is really good. It means that the cohorts are really similar um, apart from one has uh, COVID and one another doesn't. So the actual results of um, the study, uh, we have the incremental cost of COVID-19 COVID patients was £2.44 per patient uh, and only 0 0.1 consultations extra, which is not very, not very, not very many. Um, but those diagnosed with long COVID uh, is up to £30 extra per patient uh, and around one, one consult consultation. And those patients with symptoms of long COVID um, was £57 per patient, uh, which is about two, two, con two consultations. There is potentially some bias uh, in this final one because uh, the patients obviously had um, symptoms and therefore more likely to um, use, use up, up more resources. Uh, and also these are not necessarily all long COVID patients. Um, they're just showing symptoms and had had COVID 12 weeks prior. Uh, so I looked at the splitting the, the costs by the healthcare professional consultation type. There actually wasn't huge differences between the groups. The blue is the, um, the unaffected healthy and uh, the, the others are the, the other types of COVID um, groups. But one thing you can see uh, in the trends is that the COVID groups um, were more likely to or use more GP um, resources and more telephone um, consultations. And this could be because uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, it was a very uh, new, new, new illness and GPs um, were the ones who were dealing with it. And also um, patients with COVID, COVID symptoms were told not to come into surgeries and to, to use telephone. Uh, looking at the um, difference in cost across demographic factors created this, this heat map here, which is there's a lot going on. Um, but the, the main idea is that uh, the more yellow and red um, shadings are a higher uh, cost, and the three columns are the three types of um, the COVID, the, the three COVID um, subgroups. Uh, on in in general, um, the factors associated with much higher costs in, in comparison to the the healthy parts were people with older age, obesity, ex smoker, so all kind of the classic um, uh, things. So. Strengths of the study, it uses an incremental cost approach, which is the, the gold standard of costing. Uh, a large sample size, um, which represents the population and also really helped with the successful matching. And um, the, the results were in line with previous research looking at other respiratory illnesses. Um, the, the biggest limitation is that uh, the data uh, I had only went up until May 2021. Um, so this meant that we only really had the, the first year of the pandemic data available. Um, so there's a number of issues of, obviously there were significant lockdowns, um, diagnoses were poor, long COVID wasn't particularly known about. Um, and then I only looked at um, consultation costs, didn't look, didn't look at prescription costs and only primary care data, no secondary care data. Uh, and then finally, um, because of, especially because of the, the time period as well, uh, we can't be sure that there, weren't, there wasn't some contamination of patient groups. So possibly there are patients in the, the, health, the healthy data set, um, which may have had COVID, but just not, not diagnosed.
So thoughts of the future, um, extrapolating the incremental costs and um, using the prevalence statistics for 2021, the cost of GP nurse and physiotherapist consultations is in a range of, is around 200 million pounds, um, which is, is is a chunk. If you compare it to the whole NHS budget, it's it's small, but we have to remember that this is only a very sort of um, slim uh, number of costs so there's only consultations we haven't looked at prescription drugs secondary care uh, and the costs associated to, to NHS staff missing missing out um, due to them being absent because they have COVID. But future research uh, I'll definitely do the if I could I, I would do the, do the study again to include more data and the, the longer follow-up time uh, and also go look further into how the costs um, are affected across the subgroups. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm quickly going to pass over to Andy, who has been doing a poll as well as is going to talk about our tools to help map hospital electronic health record EHR data, as it's also known as, to the OMOP common data model. Right. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. So yeah, my oh, my name is Andy South. I'm a data engineer at University College London Hospitals. Hopefully, you might be able to see my screen now. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to be talking about standardising patient hospital patient data to the OMOP Common Data Model. And if you're kind of sitting there thinking I've got no idea what the hell OMOP is, then that's fine because I've just done a poll, and so two smart people, well, two in the know people know what OMOP is, but uh, yeah, 11 don't know what it is. So you're okay. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what it is. So I'm gonna do um, three bits here. I can't see myself, which is slightly perturbing, but never mind. Uh, let's just do this. No, it's not working, Never mind. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about what is OMOP. And then I'm gonna talk about tools that we have in UCLH to Omopify patient data. I'm not sure if that's a word, but it sounds good anyway. And then I'm going to talk about a little uh, package that I've created called Omopsept, which is about looking at uh, Omop concepts. Um, right. So, what is Omop? Uh, Omop, not Amop. And Omop is kind of one of those slightly annoying acronyms that actually doesn't really help you to know what it means and I can actually never remember what it means either I had to look it up before this so yeah don't feel like you need to remember what it is uh just it just kind of sounds nice so what but the important bit or possibly the more important bit to remember is the bit that comes after which is the common data model or the CDM so effectively it's an open data standard that means you can standardize data that makes it more easily comparable. And so why do you want a common data model? Um, well, for, partly for the reasons that Anastasia was uh, talking about earlier on. Uh, if you imagine that you have three sources of data, uh, source one and source, source two and source three. So we've got this kind of like lilac color and magenta color and gray color. So in that situation, what you could do is you could write kind of like analysis methods that worked on either of, on all of source one, two, and three. Or you could try and translate between source one, two, and three. But actually the most efficient thing to do is if you can convert them all to a common format, then your analysis methods can work off that common format. So you only need to write them once. So then you're only having to do one transformation from one, two, and three to the common data data model and so this uh this screenshot came from two months ago on the health data research uk uh website and so i don't know if people are aware of uh, another acronym sdes which are i think uh, safe data environments so this idea that you can put data into a safe data environment so that it can be combined and so nhs england have gone behind i think that's right to say that's the right organization that are, have, uh, are supporting this idea of using the OMOP common data model for, um, for putting data into these safe data environments. And actually what the 
a, a meeting that I was at a month ago, what I found really interesting is, you know, th this is going to be done at scale. So they're talking about the potential that every health, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Every health kind of uh, organization can convert their data to this standard format. And they're going to need a bunch of people to kind of do this kind of thing, which is a lot of sort of data manipulation that some of the people in this community are pretty good at doing. So I think there's going to be a real call uh, for those kind of skills for doing this sort of thing. And so one of the things about OMOP, in OMOP, everything is a concept, everything. So it's all about standardization. So there's everything is a concept and everything has an identifier. Um, so I just worked through a few. So I started at A and you can see that the triple A flex bandage of 10 centimeters has a particular concept ID. And if you look at the columns in this table, you can see that there's a domain ID and that partly relates to where it's stored within OMOP. So you've got things about measurements and observations and drugs. And then there's a vocabulary ID. So OMOP kind of subsumes or includes other vocabularies that you might be familiar with, such as SNOMED and LOINC and Dictionary of Medicines and Devices. And you know, it still surprises me how much detail there there are in these things. If you look at number four, there is the there is a code for an accident caused by a corned beef tin lid. Uh, there's also a different code for an accident caused by a sardine tin lid, um, and there's a hierarchy as well. So above or below, whichever way you look at it, uh, you know, the corned beef tin lid thing. There's an accident caused by a tin lid, which is below an accident caused by a sharp object, which is below an accident, which is below uh, a traumatic event, which is below an event. So you can use this hierarchy for um, looking at things. And yeah, you can look at number nine if you like, but it makes me quite uncomfortable. So I'm not gonna look further at that. Um, and all this, these data are stored within the OMOP common data model. Uh, so you've got a bunch of, actually not too many tables. So you can see here, here you've got like a person table, uh, measurement, observation, that kind of thing. And OMOP is now run by Odyssey, which is another slightly annoying acronym in that they pronounce it Odyssey rather than OHDSI. So uh, I spent a while working on this where I thought that Odyssey and OHDSI were two completely different things but then you find out they're actually the same thing. But this is a really good organization. It's multi-stakeholder, open science collaborative. Um, they're sort of, some of it is based in the US. So the US meeting or the global meeting is in the US in a few weeks time. And then there was a recently a UK chapter was created. And so what we do at UCLH is we provide OMOC data for research projects. So the hospital, moved to be paperless about five years ago. Don't quote me on that, but roughly that. And um, so they have an electronic health record. We have Epic, which is, you know, like a commercial system. So all of the data, all patient data goes directly into Epic. And it's mostly, that's mostly used for kind of operational and clinical purposes. But if we want to get data out for research, then we have this extraction system that allows us to get the data into an OMOP format. And largely that's about structured data. So data that is already standardized to an extent. Uh, but then also there's some work going on at UCL uh, with our collaborators um, looking at getting the you know, text notes that are unstructured into structured data that then can also go into OMOP. And so we have this extraction system that's working currently, and it's been developed on a on a per project basis. So as projects have come to us asking for data, we've written modules that output those particular bits of data, but then we retain that as a you know something that makes it better for us to be able to provide those data in future. So it's improving all the time. And these are my lovely colleagues uh, who, yeah, we mostly meet online. I'm actually going to meet them tomorrow in person, which is quite an unusual thing, but that's that'd be really nice. And we're led by uh, Tim Roberts, who's the lead architect for the hospital. And he sort of started this, our 
thing. And R is key in this. Uh, we've got the code in a GitHub private repository at the moment. There's about 10,000 lines of code. And the aspiration is to open source some of it uh, soon. It's all based on using tidyverse kind of things. There are some, I'm conscious that I'm running out of time. There are our resources developed by others. So there's some links in there. And as a side project, I developed this package, which doesn't do very much, but hopefully does it reasonably well. Um, and yeah, when I started working on this, you find that you just get all these numbers, just so many IDs and the conventional tables will not have the names associated with them. So it was just about making it easier to join the names of different concepts onto the IDs um, and to be able to um, sort of navigate your way through the hierarchy. So see, these are some of the functions. I won't go into that now, but it is on GitHub. So just to recap, uh, OMOP is a common data model. You don't need to remember what OMOP stands for. Just remember that it's a common data model. Uh, we've got some tools in UCLH for omopifying patient data. And then there's a little open source package that you can have a look at um, that allows you to look at OMOP concepts without the cons. And I was like really pleased with that acronym and how it worked. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you'll share you shared the presentation slides, you might wish to share a few of those because there's some great links at towards the end of your uh, presentation. So the next presentation that's up is with Richard, understanding hospital associated mortality using, I think it's known as SHMI, but SHMI is another acronym, acronym for an ICS. That doesn't have a different word, <laughs> unless it does, and I've missed that one. And over right. to you, Richard. Hopefully you can see the presentation. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Just go. before Zoe asks, is the code available? There's a QR code. You go straight to the Ooh, GitHub and you. you can get it there. So get that one in early. Um, <laughs> it's amazing we can do it in two minutes before your slide starts. So this is not to talk about the shimmy, the summary hospital mortality indicator. It's more about can it be used to provide an insight into hospital associated mortality for commissioners? And the bit which why why do this? Well, the shimmy, unlike other mortality measures, includes deaths following discharge up to 30 days, which moves the shimmy from being really just a hospital measure into one that's also related to the community. And therefore, there's a question about, well, we've got this measure, which allegedly predicts the expectation of mortality, and can we use it to provide any insights for integrated care board system partnership, depending whichever level you want to do, but basically any ICS. Um, this is actually taking forward a piece of work I did before last year. I presented on the trust level report. This is basically reporting it by ICB and it's using basically recycling the same code or similar. So the data is available to any ICB via its CSU, Commission Support Unit because it's a national commission data set. So the NHS English Digital, NHS England Digital provide a shimmy extract file, which basically provides the same data set that is provided to trusts or made available to trusts, but for ICB. So it's people resident or treated in your ICB for any trust. So you can get your out of area flows and you get the inpatient emissions for the last three years. And it's broken down and grouped into the variables used to create the shimmy. So you get age, sex, the main diagnostics, main diagnosis, plus I think it's up to 20 additional diagnoses, mission method, discharge method, palliative care, admission date, discharge date, and birth weight. Because those are the major um, factors involved in creating the shimmy. But surprisingly, considering it's all about the shimmy, they don't actually give you the episode the mortality risk for that spell you have to calculate that yourself but it's easy enough to do there is a risk calculator i've built um using the published data model uh, so you can just run that against the data file so in the github you've got all the files which does does all this apart from there's no data because you might guess there's no data in a public github so you've got this data set you've asked energy digital well when you've gone through the csu don't have to ask energy digital for it and it's been provided to you. So what can you do with it? Well, using the markdown I've produced, it's basically taking a similar sort of 
presentation to the one we heard e earlier about um, fit. So basically, I've just created a, a HTML document, um, but controlled the content via multiple child documents. So lots of include um, params. So you can just use a knit where you just evaluate params, include place, and the file you're going to use um, just to include it. So you can change the content based on various chapters and things you want to look at. In terms of, so we've got things like, well, we can, because we've got the emissions and the counter deaths, we can actually create the crude mortality rate. So this is Birmingham's. Um, so you can just drop that into SPC, the plot the dots package. So lots of recycling going on. Don't write anything yourself. Um, this is Chris who's coming to join next. He'll be talking about over dispersion. There's lots of over dispersion in these data sets. This is Birmingham and Solihull, which is the most deprived um, area in the country, ICS in the country. And shockingly, there's no LSOA, which is an out. Well, there's a couple of which aren't too happy. There are a couple which aren't particularly good, but most of our LSOAs are actually low on machine. And that's because of the high performing trust we've got, or well coded, depending which of you look at it. I know Chris will say that basically the um, the code is changing to you don't need to use a tidy. It's only become tidy specific, so you don't need to do the um, data uh, frame dollar. It's going to change to just be the variable name in a bit. You can also do it for GP practices. So we don't have any shipments. This is a very small practice up here, which is homelessness. So you'd expect it to have a high mortality, but high, low level. Most of our practices are doing very well on the shimmy, which of course relates to the acute care being provided. Um, but also you can actually look at things like we've got the population health side of things. So we've got ACORN. So we can actually look at the ACORN segmentation. What's interesting is the largest group, which looks like, oh, bloody hell, this is a quite high shimmy, is actually inactive communal, communal population students um so this breaks it down so there's lots of students in birmingham who have a um students don't get admitted very often so they have a very low expectation of death so if they do die then they tend to be um high shimmy so sometimes the shimmy can actually show you how the hospital activity measures perform because as i say this is a low risk population and therefore we do see a population high mortality. It's quite surprising that it's actually students. There are other ones like dangerous dependencies. I've got to look up these ones because they're really interesting, like perilous futures. Um, just some great names for things. Uh, there's one at the bottom, which is despondent diversity, which is actually doing very, very well, which is predominantly our ethnic populations. Again, younger, surprisingly, not as disadvantaged as we might expect them to be. One of the things we can also do is the VLAD. So the VLAD is a variable life adjusted display. This is how energy is digital, show like a QSUM type approach. Um, so each one of these is a patient. Each one of these little marks up and down is a spell. So what you've got is basically the red is the deteriorating, um, boy, increasing number of deaths um, as they occur. So the expect it's basically observed minus expected. Is that one? Yeah. Um, so basically, we actually have got some issues with cancer of the bone. Not surprisingly, in Birmingham, we've got a high level of infant mortality. So short gestation does come out as being our worst. But this is just one of the trackers. Um, Energy Digital only supply your VLAD for 10 conditions. With this tool, you can do it for every single condition. Um, so we can actually spot things like the uh, bone cancer ones, which might be related to our spe spec comes. It may not be bone cancer per se, but just more emissions for bone cancer. So that's Vlad. So basically that's what I was going to talk about, very lightly, because I've wondered what to talk about. So it was just to try and get you excited by the fact there's a data set out there which is applied to ICSs, which can show you some interesting things about mortality in your community. As I say, there's no value statement on the shimmy in terms of what it actually tells you in terms of the quality of services, but it allows you to look at it internally and see whether or not there's any sort of cohorts of interest. Um, obviously, we've got funnels, we can convert them to maps. Um, so the code is all on the GitHub. You can use a QR code if not. Um, and also including the predictor code, so you can create your own Jimmy predictor. But you will need to go and get your own data from Jimmy Extraction Service or through your CSU. So I shall stop there. I think I'm on time, if not a little bit early. Boom. You are.
I wrote a question in Slack, <laughs> so I get a chance to ask it. You said um, the gestation period was short in Birmingham. Of course, what what's the reasoning behind so that? I'm not familiar Birmingham with Birmingham has a very high level of infant mortality. So mm -hmm. short gestation is deaths within a very short um, window after birth. So it's just reflecting the high infant mortality. It's a very a difficult indicator that one because of course it gets associated with poor maternity services when in actual fact it's more reflection of the not saying passes over to bcc colleagues but it's more reflective of public health and there's a high instance of consanguinity and therefore high genetic um disorders in birmingham which leads to early infant mortality so that's why it is it also expected. specialist all... services as well? Um, is it also specialist services as well? It will do. Um, People travelling in yeah, are more likely to be high risk. Imported network stuff, especially because Birmingham Women's and Children is the major neonatal surgery for the network. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Well, we can continue this conversation on Slack um, because now we're going to pass over to Chris, who's going to talk about, mod as it was mentioned, modelling count data. What is over dispersion and why should you care? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Can I have a wave, Zoe, if you can? Fantastic. Thanks. And have you got my screen? Brilliant. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Chris Maney. Um, you might have heard me um, before um, causing slight havoc in the questions. Uh, apologies, I, I rather ambushed that um, presenter earlier on. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today relates to count data models. Now, you might think that's a little bit specialist, um, but I hope I can make the case to you that count data models are actually a, a lot more ubiquitous than you think they are and you may well be using them a lot of the time when you don't realize you are. Um, but I want to just quote George Box first if I could who's a, a sort of famous statistician you've probably all heard this in one way or another before but um, to, to quote him it says uh, it has been said that all models are wrong but some models are useful. In other words any model is at, at best a useful fiction. There never was or ever will be an exact normal distribution or an, uh, an exact linear relationship. Nevertheless, enormous progress has been made by entertaining such fictions and using them as approximations. And he said a few other things that were kind of related. But he said, so the question you need to ask is, is the model true? It never is. But is the model good enough for this particular use case? And he did just throw one final quote in was that he also said, since all models are wrong, the scientist must be alert to what is importantly wrong. It's inappropriate to be concerned about safety from mice when there are tigers abroad. So I'm hoping to explain what one of these tigers uh, waiting to ambush you is uh, by way of over dispersion. So firstly, count data, what is it? So to give you a kind of formal definition-ish, uh, so count data can be thought of as an aggregated version or summaries of more detailed data on the occurrence of some event. So to explain that a little bit more, uh, two common descriptions are observation and point process. So how many times has a thing happened? Like how many people have turned up at a clinic? Um, but the other one is the discretization of a continuous outcome. So um, let's say you only count things in certain intervals. Um, imagine you were measuring blood pressure, but you could only measure to the whole unit. So you then discretized your data into whole units. Um, now it's possible to have a blood pressure between those values, but you're only counting them in those set buckets. So it's got a few properties then count data. So they are generally natural whole numbers. By that, I mean integers. So there's no decimals. So if you were to count uh, patients turning up at hospital, for example, you can have two or three of them, but you're not going to have two and a half patients turn up. Hopefully not anyway. Um, they range from zero to infinity. So you can't have minus one patients turn up, for example. Um, the counts are sort of theoretically treated as though they occur in a fixed time period and they've got a known average. Now, you can... Um, do this over a longer period and you can use kind of a denominator for it but that's when you move into proportions so first uh, gotcha is that a proportion or a percentage is a count so the other key thing is that not normally distributed um, in general so particularly when they have low counts uh, which i'll show you in terms of a look at the distribution so the plot on the right hand side is a distribution so if you can imagine that the average count value is along the bottom axis here 
and this is the density, so this is where the weight of the distribution sits. So as you can see, it gets truncated at zero, and the weight of the lower ones is quite skewed, so the tail pulls out quite a long way. Now, strictly speaking, the Poisson distribution is the correct distribution for a count model in its sort of simplest form. Now, the Poisson distribution isn't defined between the integers, so you can't apply the Poisson distribution to something like a 1.5 count or whatever. It has to be those discrete counts. Now, functionally, so my question earlier was about whether or not um, the presenter had used a Poisson model and they'd used a linear model. Um, now, functionally, when your counts get much higher, um, it's pretty much the same as a, as a linear model. So back to the first George Box quote um, in that you're, you're, begging, you're building a model and they're all wrong. So importantly, how wrong is it and is it suitable for the application? And if it is, um, maybe I'm being a little bit purist here, but uh, I would suggest that using the right paradigm for the model is probably the right way to go. So the single parameter in the Poisson distribution, importantly, is this mean. So this center point here. But in the Poisson distribution, the mean is actually also the variance. So that might sound complicated, um, but this means that there is no check on your data as to how much the dispersion of the data is affected at all. It's always theoretically fixed by where the mean is. It's also similar to with binomial distribution. So just in case you think you were gonna get away with it with uh, binaries, so counting deaths, for example, like in the last example, um, we're generally counting them up into counts so it's numbers of deaths. Um, so there you've got a count. Uh, but the binomial distribution itself also has a similar relationship where the, the number of events defines the variance. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that even if you don't know you're using it, if you're using something that was generated as a count, you're actually already applying a Poisson model. You just don't know it. You're applying an empty model, a model with no predictors, because it's characterized by the average rate already. So it's important, I would say, whenever you're using any count data to understand that it is a Poisson model and that the mean of it is very much dictated by this. Um, now, in reality, the Poisson assumptions are violated all of the time. It's very, very rare that I've, I don't think I've ever fitted a model that was uh, almost perfect in terms of the distribution. They're always quite a long way off. So that leads you to a thing called over dispersion. Now, our definition might be a bit confusing, the where the conditional variance is greater than the conditional mean. But if you remember a second ago, I said the variance and the mean are the same thing in the Poisson distribution. But what if your data is not quite Poisson distributed? It's sort of mostly Poisson distributed. There's a good chance that the variance doesn't actually equal the mean. And in most cases, there's a lot more variance in your data than you would expect from the Poisson distribution alone. But the consequence is that if you calculate something like a uh, confidence interval, or you have any sort of standard error or a statistical test on it, you're actually making um, far too optimistic an assumption about the error. Your error term is gonna be very small and you're gonna be really overly sure of yourself when you shouldn't be because the error is actually much larger than your tests um, are showing you. So here's an example. So uh, similar to what Richard had a minute ago, this is a funnel plot, um, but this is taking um, NHSE produced readmissions data. Sorry, NHS digital it was at the time, but it's now NHSE. Um, and we have a standardized ratio of the expected number of readmissions versus the actual number of readmissions. Now take this inner orange limit to be a 95% limit. So if that was a, a rational assumption, you'd expect um, 19 out of 20 data points to be inside that orange limit. So that really isn't the case, right? So we're looking at this here. So our data is much, much more widely scattered than our sort of natural assumptions are, are lending us to, to understand. And actually having tested the dispersion ratio on this data set, it's actually 86.4. And that means it's 86 times larger than we would expect from a Poisson model alone. So that's quite a lot, I think you'd agree. So how do you deal with it? Well, firstly, we need to actually be able to test that we can we can tell when it's over dispersed or not. Um, now forgive the probably mathsy definition here, but some of you might be happier with this and others. Um, but the code is all here and the code's available on GitHub and you can uh, pick it up and play with it to your heart's content. But you would expect if it was perfectly Poisson uh, distributed, that the sum of the squared residuals from the model is the same as the residual degrees of freedom. 
So you could put them together as a ratio. So if the ratio is higher than one, um, it's over dispersed. So if you've got a dispersion ratio and it's approaching one, you're generally fairly happy. If it's much higher than one, you have over dispersion. You can have under dispersion, but that's um, quite rare to encounter in, in practice. So option number one, ignore it. And that is genuinely an option. Lots and lots of people, and I would say particularly in the NHS, tend to ignore it. Um, it's not irrational because it depends on what question you're asking. So it might be that um, you are fitting a model and you want to look at the mean of that model. It doesn't really assist you necessarily if you're not interested in confidence intervals to do any further work on it. You've already got the mean assessed. So it does depend slightly on the question. So I know I'm making a, a big stand against on this, uh, this point of uh, having correct count models, but it does depend on your question. So method number two, get some more information. So I've said this uh, imperfect world uh, and data that we uh, get from real world systems never perfectly resembles the distribution. Um, but if you get some more data about it, you could generally get some more information and reduce the over dispersion. And the main things that you should look for for trying to do that are the presence of outliers. So outliers, again, is a slightly contentious term because is an outlier an extreme data point or is it a member of a different distribution? That's very much up for debate. Um, but if you've got any obvious outliers, like a data quality issue or something or other in the way you're counting something, that's a very obvious gotcha that's going to mess your model up. And it might be worth considering how you treat them, how you uh, impute them, change them, remove them, etc. Um, so next point is aggregation. So aggregation loses detail. So if you count up information about 100 patients and then you present it in one line, you've lost the nuance of those 100 patients. So you might have a good overall summary, but you've lost the nuance. So anytime you're using aggregated data, if you're able to back it up so you have record level data, you'll have more information going into it and that will likely reduce the over dispersion. Missing parameters. Now this is usually sort of affected by the fact that you just don't have any more information in a given data set. But if you do have some more information that could be pertinent to it, it's worth examining what other things you can put into the model to make it better calibrated. Uh, and this is the point about poorly specified model components. By this, I mean, um, when we prepare our data, we can prepare data in a kind of rational or irrational ways. So if you're putting age into a model, for example, um, okay, age is probably a, is a count variable here, but let's consider it to be continuous because you could be um, two and a half years old, for example. Um, breaking that up into bins of five years at a time, so putting them into this five year age categories, is possibly a little bit wasteful um, in the model. When if you put a function in there that, that um, like a spline or something, which drew across the age quite nicely, you would be characterizing the variation in age much better. Or even if you put it in as just a raw number and it fits the average age. So consider how you prepare your data. And sometimes we make um, daft choices on our parameterization because it's the way we always do it. So five-year age bands in particular is a common way people prepare data to go into a model, but it's actually rarely the right way to do it if you want to reduce the over dispersion. So third way, characterize the variance better. So by that, I mean, let's try and get a better estimation of the variance. So our model is, is making a, a poor assessment of the variance. Can we bolt some things on to try and get a better assessment of the variance? So firstly, bootstrapping. Bootstrapping means taking random resamples of your data and iteratively refitting it over and over again, and then averaging across. It's a really, really powerful technique for validating all sorts of different statistics because generally the more you repeat a thing, the more you reduce the variance. Uh, so it actually does quite a good job of reducing some of the over dispersion. Um, it won't tackle all the over dispersion uh, to do with clustering and stuff, which we'll uh, talk about a little bit later, but it's a good first step, particularly if you don't want to change anything in your model. And then we have a bunch of other model types that we can apply where we'll scale the variance. We can simply change it post hoc when we're reporting, um, which I'll show you later, which is how um, it's handled for things like the shimmy with that funnel plot. Um, uh, or the use of mixture models and random intercepts, all of which sounds a little bit fancy, but I'll show you visually in a minute. So by way of demonstrating code in a couple of places here, uh, I've pulled the count library out um, and AR um, 
was something I was using for an OD test. So I've left that in accidentally. You only really need the count model there. And I'm using the demo data set called MedPAR, which is um, a cut of medical data from uh, the US. So I'm building a base Poisson model here, which is a GLM to predict the length of stay in that data set with a few other factors. And it's a Poisson um, model. So when I then test that for the overdispersion using the function we had before, I've got a dispersion ratio of 6.24. So it's 6.24 uh, times the variance than we're expecting in our model alone. So that works through to these confidence intervals here. So these are each of the terms in my model. So keep an eye on these when we change them. Um, I find it easiest to just anchor my view to one of them and use that to guide it. So um, let's take this 9.85. If this is too narrow, we should expect every way that we um, work with it and counteract it to make that increase to go larger. So first method here, um, the so-called sandwich estimators, which sounds better than it, than it is, I think. Um, so the idea of this is, is a different way of working out the, um, the variance of a model using an inflation of the variance covariance matrix. And that comes through the R package called sandwich, and it's got quite a long history. It's referred to as robust confidence intervals a lot of the time. So you can simply substitute in a, a sandwich version of the same thing, and it will calculate it for you and give you the confidence intervals. We can see immediately there the confidence interval has shot up, so we've got a better estimation there. You can use a thing called quasi-likelihood, um, which again sounds fancy, but realistically it is uh, fitting a slightly looser um, generalized linear model of Poisson regression um, that allows an extra parameter to scale. Now, because it's slightly looser, it doesn't have a full maximum likelihood, which we would get in a normal generalized linear model. So if you use things like um, AIC, which we saw earlier in um, the um, nice model development for working out which model to, to pick, you won't get an AIC through this because you're missing the maximum likelihood. Uh, but it does a really good job of scaling the, um, the the confidence intervals for you. Now, mixture models, these are the ones that are most useful, I would say. So using a mixture model is where you take a distribution rather than just using the Poisson. What if you use the Poisson for part of it and another distribution for another part of it, like the gamma, um, which is in the, the standard negative binomial, or the normal distribution? And I'll explain that in a second with the... Um, random interceptor model visually. But that's a really good way of doing it. And generally the negative binomial model, you can consider that to be a Poisson model, but it scales the variance. Um, that's a really good way because you simply substitute it in. I'm using the GLM NB function rather than GLM. And you need the mass package installed for that. That does a much, much better job. But multi-level models are another thing um, where we can adapt a thing called a random effect. So in random effects, what we're saying is that we have um, more than one source of variance. So in the case of clustering at a hospital or say uh, in a clinical trial or something, we're expecting uh, variance between the data points, but also between clusters as well. So by doing this, this is a very complicated topic. So I would recommend going to um, Bristol's um, Center for Multi-Level Modeling because they've got a lot of good stuff in there. But we would use um, the LME4 library or some of the others like GLM, M, TMB or Bayesian approaches. But we add a so-called random intercept, which looks visually like this. So if you can imagine in a normal model, you have a single intercept characterizing data points. But this is assuming these are all independent. But what if they're not? What if they're all from the same centers and they've all actually got local means that are different? So this allows us to fit a local intercept or a local mean then that is separate from the global mean and the distance allows you to inflate the variance. So that would mean it looks something like this. Each one of the different um, hospitals, for example, that's hospital code, might have a slightly different intercept and that allows you to adjust the variance appropriately. So I'm aware I'm running out of time. I'm just going to run through the last couple of things. Um, so there is a post hoc adjustment, um, which is what we see in the likes of Shimmy model. Um, so this is where we take um, the random intercept uh, idea that is often used for clinical trials for things called meta-analysis. Uh, and we make some assumptions of scaling it based on the dispersion ratio. And then we end up adjusting our limits from this is the first one that you saw on the first slide up to an adjusted limit here which pushes out much further. And you can see actually this is much more in line with what we would expect for a few outliers um, adjusted for the process. So there's a few objections to it. It's quite complicated. 
you're darn right. Yes, it's quite complicated. Um, but I would suggest that being wrong about the error in your model is probably quite important. <laughs> so it's probably worth investing the time to understand it, at least at least minimally. Uh, people often say with those funnel plots, uh, we prefer the normal limits um, because we don't want to miss anything. We want to be a bit more conservative, make sure we count all of the outliers. Yes, but you've got loads and loads of false positives there, right? So um, you could make sure that everybody um, was detected in a test um, if you simply say everyone has a condition, but that's not true. Um, there's a few other objections there about whether or not it looks like a funnel or not. Um, but broadly, if you're getting the error wrong in your model, you probably want to work on getting the error right. So in conclusion, you're using count data all the time, whether you realize it or not, and it's got a very fixed assumption about its variance. In the real world, we've got messy data and that's almost always over dispersed. If you can get more information, you can add more parameters, that often helps. You can scale the models with a few simpler techniques, um, but I would really recommend using things like the negative binomial or a random intercept where you have um, a clear reason to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. and. Um... Thank you to everybody. There are no questions on that one, but um, Chris is going to be doing some more workshop things and there was already a workshop that he did. We'll do all the recordings for everything after our in-person event next week. So just watch this space for YouTube to catch up. Plus you can keep on with the conversations in Slack. I'd just like to thank everybody today um, for the speakers. Tomorrow's session will start at 1.30 and that's uh, UK time and we'll again have plenaries and lightning talks but we'll also have a keynote speaker at around four o'clock that's the UK time again from Cosima Mayer who's going to be joining us to talk about building bridges exploring open source library development in R and Python and this is something I'm sure you're being here mean that you know that we're keen to support this across both communities the NHSR community and NHS PyCom. I look forward to seeing everybody um, tomorrow again and all the speakers and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you so much and goodbye.